Oh, the weather outside is frightful, but the fire is so delightful. And since we've no place to go, let it fight a man. Hello everybody, uh, no frills this time, just jumping straight into the introduction. If you haven't watched the anime collection video, you don't have to. If you don't like anime, you do your own person, you don't have to abide by the rules of which I have set upon to watch this media, there's no prerequisites. But, uh, in that anime collection video, I explain the situation, I'm moving soon, moving uh, out of the country, media collection going in box, so I thought I'd showcase this. Um, for my film collection, I'm only going to go over the Blu-rays that I own, maybe one or two DVDs as well if I feel like I really specifically want to talk about it. But for the most part, I'm just going to go over the Blu-rays because my film collection is far larger than my anime collection, and the Blu-rays alone are, far, are larger than my anime collection. Um, so yeah, without any real further ado, let's just jump straight into it. Jumping straight into the beer this time. So first, we're starting off with 2001 A Space Odyssey by uh, Stanley Kubrick, who I hear is an up-and-coming young director. He's making some big names. I don't know. I don't know how far he'll get, but, you know, if this is any indication, I think he's got a pretty good career ahead of him. That's good. It's so fucking hot today. So 2001 A Space Odyssey is probably my favorite Kubrick film, tied with Dr. Strangelove. Um, I feel they best exhibit, those two best exhibit uh, the sort of dichotomy of what Kubrick did, of really clever, funny satire, and then uh, this film sort of exploring the, the depths of existentialism and the realization that no matter how advanced of a society we become, we will never truly understand how this universe works. Um, and that's basically what this film is. Like, you never think you can never truly fully comprehend what's going on in this film not because the film is super smart just because we're super dumb and the film is just trying to present this situation that you have to think up of the answers you have to think up of what is happening you have to come up to the conclusion of what the hell's going on with the ending what the monoliths mean um, i mean obviously uh the the original author arthur c clark obviously it explained a bit more in the novel and some of the crazy sequels, which I haven't actually read. I've read all of, like, 2000, 2010, which seems like a fucking riot. But, you know, obviously, there it's there to an extent. But the way it's presented in the film, which I think is the important part, because that's what most people are going to experience, is very much left up to your own devices. And that's why I think uh, a lot of people have sort of uh, quite differing opinions on the film. I know people who hate this film. They think it's boring pretentious and I know people like myself who, who love it and I think that's fine um I like the fact that films have the power to do that films have the power to spark dis spark discussion and uh make different types of people react to it in different ways um this film looks amazing still uh really slow methodical drawn out the stuff with like Hal on the spaceship is is great like this was hard sci-fi before hard sci-fi was cool <laughs> um like you know exactly how long and methodical all the procedures in the film take like i think there's even a tiny detail of like when the astronauts are being interviewed um by the tv presenter back on earth it's something like oh there is a 16 minute delay between their answers and receiving it because of the way that the the radio waves would travel which means when you think about it that interview would have taken like fucking days to record the entire thing and i think that's great um so yeah, each of the sections is great. Uh, the Dawn of Man is great. Uh, that section with Hal is great. Jupiter and Beyond the Infinite is great, except the only part of this movie I think is drawn out, because a lot of people think this movie is really slow and long, and I admit it's not something I can watch every day. Um, but the only part I think is drawn out would be the light tunnel sequence. I like it, but it's the only part that feels like it stretches on for a bit too long. Once you get past that, though, once he's in like the room and he's seeing the various versions of himself, brilliant, perfect. Um, so yeah, 2001 A Space Odyssey, fantastic hard sci-fi, uh, brilliant use of classical music before using classical music to underscore science fiction became cliche, <laughs> brilliant use of uh, classical music, uh, amazing visuals, amazing soundscape, it's one of the first, I don't know if one of the first, but it's, it's a film that embraces that without a, without, without something to travel through, uh, sound, 
sound waves don't make any noise. So the scenes in space are silent, which is fantastic. Great film if you haven't seen it and you're like a cinephile or you're a fan of Kubrick, I highly recommend it. you do it. Next up, we have Alien, which is very easily, and I think probably for the rest of my life, will stay in my top five films. This film is incredible. I remember the first time I watched it in sort of like mid-high school, and all I knew about the Alien franchise was Alien vs. Predator, which I'd seen and thought was schlock and dumb and stupid. I actually thought this about both Alien and Predator because of that. So when I watched this movie for the first time in like when I was like 14, I was expecting Alien vs. Predator. Instead, I got a, basically a masterpiece. This film is absolutely incredible. I watched it the other night with some friends who had never seen it before. And none of them were particularly big film guys, but they were all sort of blown away by it. You know, so like they kept saying this was this was 1979. This looks fucking fantastic. Um, the only bits that I think have aged, ironically, are the parts with the alien. Everything else in the film looks pretty much... If you released it today, I don't think too many people would complain. There'd be some who would call it probably retro or some shit, but you know, I'd love to see this on the cinema screen. But yeah, the, the only parts that don't really... That haven't really aged particularly well are the parts with the alien, but that's why movie's so good because the movies sort of know knew that when they were making it they knew that if you held on the alien a bit too long it looks like a man in a rubber suit because it is a man in a rubber suit who they paid like i'm told like five pounds a day or something ridiculous he got a bit shafted but um yeah that's why the editing of this film is so incredible um because it never fully shows you ne tries to never fully show you a, a complete view of the alien you only get glimpses which adds to the, the threat of it this thing will just appear and fuck you up um the design of the spaceship i think is everlasting i love 70s and 80s science fiction like a used future you know um i like a sleek and modern look too i like variety but i'm particularly fond of that really just like shove whatever the fuck on the spaceship design this old rickety clunky bricky thing who knows what it does it probably does something it just gives you this idea that it was just cobbled together of whatever the engineers of the spaceship could to make it work at the behest of the terrible company that sends them out there it's great um all the stuff in space looks fantastic the opening sequence oh is so good with just a long slow pan across the cosmos as the title of alien slowly fades in this film i could gosh about this film forever it's amazing it's fantastic the way it handles its characters, the way each, basically each quarter feels like a different movie, but they all feel like the same movie together. Ripley is a fantastic character. You don't, even, it doesn't even really feel like she's the main character at the beginning, but then again, that's part of the way that it twists and turns. You think it's an ensemble, and then very quickly, <laughs> by the end, it's just Ripley. Um, so amazing film. I highly recommend it if you haven't seen Alien, if you've only seen Alien vs Predator, or you only know about Alien from pop culture, please watch this film. Uh, I highly doubt it will disappoint unless you're a horrible husk of a creature who has no sense of taste whatsoever, or you just happen to not like it, which is fine because people have different tastes in movies, but I highly recommend you watching it. It's a fantastic movie, and um, I don't think I'll stop loving it anytime soon. Up next is Animal Kingdom, which is an Australian crime thriller film. If you know anything about the Australian film industry, then you know that every single Australian film is a crime thriller film, but that's a topic for another day. Well, probably today too, because most of the films in my collection that are Australian are like this, but this is a particularly good one. This is a this is great. It's It focuses on basically uh, a really a young man with severe arrest of development because his mother was a junkie. Um, his mother overdoses. He's put into the foster care of his extended family, who all seem sort of, you know, nice and more sort of well-adjusted, but they're very prominent, um, very prominent kingpins in the Melbourne drug scene. And it's just this really great, very slow, chill, methodical... The content is very bleak, but it's also not in-your-face, obnoxious bleak. It's just sort of like these characters are going about their lives and they lead miserable lives, despite the fact they're well off because they're in the drug trade, but there's just no happiness for them. And whatever happiness they could find is stilted by their profession. The All the performances are really good. It's one of the films that helped launch Joel Edgerton into the tra trajectory of his career path that he's on now. The main actor who plays the male lead, I'm not sure his name, let me just check it up. Um, 
Ben Mills? No, that's not it. Uh, introduce uh, James Frenchville. Yeah, that that must be it because he's super young. He's like seventeen, and he's fantastic in the role at just playing this kid because he's got like, you know, he's got like a chiseled jaw. He's beefy. He looks like he would be, you know, you know, like on the football team and like having his life together and everything. But he's just so awkward and repressed and no idea how to emote or feel anything. There's a fantastic scene where he's with his girlfriend and the girlfriend's like, why are you even with me? And all he can say is, because you're nice. And like, he just cannot, you know, function. He's been he's been so thrown under the, the bus because of through his childhood because of his terrible family. So yeah, great film, really good soundtrack. Um, yeah, just a wonderful crime film. I do know that there was an American miniseries they made out of this, which I've been told is actually not that bad. I tried watching the first episode and couldn't do it because it felt like a literal line for line translation, which doesn't really work because a lot of the particular idiolects within, uh, the characters of the film and just in Australian slang and Australian, uh, the way Australians tend to construct their sentences tend to be a little awkward when said by Americans. So yeah, but I don't know. I haven't seen the full thing, so maybe that's pretty good too, but I highly recommend the film. It's great. Now we have Arrival by my boy, Denis Villeneuve, um, who at this point seemingly can do no wrong. He can do slightly less good, but I don't think he can do any wrong. This film really sort of blew me away, even though I was a fan of Villeneuve before I watched it. The fact that somebody could make something in the vein of 2001 A Space Odyssey and have it be seen on such a mainstream public level is incredible, and I'm absolutely delighted that it is. Um, it's by no means too deep. I hate the word deep. It's by no means too complex or too obtuse or, you know, or anything like that. It's, it's actually quite self-explanatory. Well, I think it is anyway. But the fact that a science fiction film can deal with these sort of themes still and be very popular and successful, I'm incredibly happy about. Um, all the performance is really good. Amy Adams is really good, um, which is surprising because I'm not, I wasn't a particularly big fan of Amy Adams before this movie, um, but she does a very great performance in this. Um, uh, what's the other guy's name? Fucking Jeremy... Le 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 yeah, Jeremy Renner, that's his name. Fucking, I, I don't know actors particularly well, to be honest. <laughs> I'm not that focused on them. But he's really good. Um, I like how minimal his role is, too, honestly, because it does sort of feel like this type of film. Yeah, we got the spunky female lead, who then meets the male co-scientist, and together they're the tag team, but she can only do it with him. She's honestly pretty fucking independent and does most of the shit herself, and he's kind of just there for emotional support, which I like, which is refreshing. Um, the way the film's edited is particularly good. I like, like, the way that when you realize where in the chronology the opening scenes actually fit into the storyline, I'm like, brilliant, perfect. There's a repeated shot from the opening that when it first, I, I felt like clapping in the theater when I saw it for the first time. It was so good, but I don't because clapping in the theater, unless the people involved in the production are there, is a heinous crime. Please do not do it. Uh, <laughs> but, um... Yeah, editing is fantastic. I love the way they commit to actually making the way that the aliens communicate seem like a real hardcore thing that would need significant attention to uh, actually decipher. You know, it's not that they don't break it overnight. And uh, all of the, the, the conflict in the movie comes about through miscommunication, which is honestly, I think, the biggest reason if an alien species were to land on Earth, that would be what would happen just because there'd be so few ways to actually communicate with them. And so the way they actually, you know, went hard on the, there were no cheats. It's just, yeah, they, they communicate in a way that is nearly inconceivable to human brains, which, which I love. Um, great film, great performances. I'm really happy this movie exists. Uh, probably my favorite film of 2016. Um, yeah, fantastic. If you haven't checked it out, please do so. So now we have the Back to the Future trilogy collection. Uh, I got this, I think, on clearance at, um... <laughs> You know, it, it's funny, like, some of my Blu-rays have, like, a good story behind how I found it, you know, it's like, oh, I traveled to, I traveled to a different city to meet a guy at a market whose son had found it in the lost tomb of Tutankhamun, and we bonded over the regaled stories of yonder, you know, some of the stories are like that, but most of the time it's like, 
oh, I went to the local electronic shop and they were having a clearance, so I bought it. Or I looked online and the retailer had it in stock, so I bought it because it was reasonably priced. So a lot of them don't have a decent story about how I found them, especially with my film Blu-rays, because film in general is a bit easier to source in Australia than it is compared to anime. Um, but yeah, uh, back to actually talking about Back to the Future. Um, I like all three films, but the first one is the only one that I think that is great. I love the first Back to the Future. Uh, when I saw it, it's one of the first films that started my interest in films and filmmaking, because I think when I saw it when I was like five for the first time, it was the first time I realized that movies were actually made by people. They weren't just these magical things that existed. And it got me interested in learning about and thinking about how it was actually made. Um, I think it's a wonderfully well-structured film. Uh, the pacing is really great. I can watch it anytime. It feels like it flies by. The characters are really good. Doc and Marty, you know, such an iconic, wonderful duo. Um, it's not particularly realistic, but I think that's fine. I don't like how people use realistic as some sort of qualifier for a film to, to say, yeah, that means it's good, because I think it's more important, rather than being realistic, I think the most important thing is just for it to feel real for the world that the film is trying to portray more than anything else. Um, and in that sense, the world that Back to the Future tries to portray, everything it does makes it feel real, which is fantastic. Even like, you know, the time travel science, I don't like, I love time travel films, but I don't like when they go too heavy into their own, say, this is, we do the quantum flex and we fucking do the, we dab back into the past and reround ourselves. Unless you go super hard, like Primer, even Primer doesn't even really go into the exact details of the time machine works. All you need is flux capacitor, that's how it works. So yeah, I love the first Back to the Future. This, this, the sequels are a bit mixed. The second one, um, I loved it as a kid, but I look at it now and it's a very, very uneven mixed mag. The first half of the film is kind of shit, doesn't hold up very well. Um, the second half, once they go back to the Donald Trump past, um, and I'm not making, I'm not memeing, they actually designed the biff of the alternate 1985 to be based on Trump <laughs> at the time, which is the most, like, I think... Uh, they always say Simpsons predicted Trump. What about fucking Back to the Future? But, um, yeah, once you get that stuff, it's really fun and great. And then the third one I didn't like as a kid, but I look at it now, it's solid. It holds itself. It knows what it is. It's straight Western. The climax is very good. It rounds out the trilogy. It's, yeah. So, I like all three films. I'm glad I own all three films. I probably wouldn't have bought the two individually if it didn't come in the collection, because I would have just really wanted... If I really, really had to just get one, it would just be the first, but I'm glad I own all three. Yep, they're great films, big part of my childhood, very nostalgic. I can still watch them today and enjoy them. Now we move on to Blade Runner, which no matter where I looked here in Australia, I could not find a version that had a great cover. This has an okay cover. This is this is not too bad. Some of the other ones looked horrendous. But some of the other covers I've seen look so much better than this, and this is a recurring theme in Australia in particular, and in particular with films I really like, they'll have shocking covers here. It'll be like fucking, like they grabbed like a high school aspiring graphic designer who doesn't know anything yet to do it because he, you know, he likes the things and it'll work for fucking free. But another the cover, Blade Runner, don't really need to talk too much about Blade Runner. It's one of those films that it's Blade Runner. I can't really say too much about it. It's brilliant. Basically invented the aesthetic, the visual aesthetic of cyberpunk because the concepts of cyberpunk were invented by... William Gibson's Neuromancer novel, but the visual aesthetic, pretty much everything pays homage to Blade Runner. Um, so, you know, wonderful visual landscape, fantastic soundscape, uh, the Vangela score, perfect, brilliant. Um, it's one of those films where you're watching it for the most part and you think this is beautiful and it's all well put together, but you don't really, can't really connect to it. Well, this is, I'm speaking from my perspective. I'm using that second person you again to describe my experience with it. But, yeah, I went along and I couldn't really connect to it the first time, but then you get to that end scene, Roy Batty's soliloquy, one of the best speeches in film, Tears and Rain speech, and I suddenly got it, and it was beautiful and fantastic, I love this film, everything makes sense, that scene is perfect, I love it, love this film, I need to rewatch it, it's been a long time since I rewatched it, Ridley Scott can suck my dick, he's not a replicant, he's an idiot, Ridley Scott doesn't understand his own fucking properties, I'm so glad Villeneuve was the one who did fucking 
fucking 2040 because goddamn yeah fuck ridley scott he somehow made two of the best movies of all time and i question how much involvement he actually had with it because of how much of a fucking hack and how much shit he's actually he said in the years since so yeah watch blade runner it's a really good film children of men uh this is a very gripping documentary about the life on the streets of modern london uh no i'm kidding uh, <laughs> fantastic fantastic post-apocalyptic sci-fi film premise of what happens if basically the world became infertile no children were born aka modern japan um but a really gripping film really uh it's one of those movies one of the things i really appreciate this is that the way it shows people trying to still live their lives even though the apocalypse is impending because that's not not a lot of things really explore how people live during the apocalypse or during the post-apocalypse the, quite the same way that this film that's a bit of a same other things have done it but i really like the way that this film just sort of shows it you know like even when they're on super important missions you know like they're dry like when leo cleo i think it's clear whatever when <laughs> when he catches up with the um his ex-girlfriend his ex-wife and the whole uh you know re re la resistance organization and they're driving to the car you know they're joking around they're talking about their college days and you know they're trying to distract themselves from their shitty lives just how people do now and i appreciate details like that you know like the opening sequence he's just going to work he's getting his coffee the terrorist explosion happens and they've just got to deal with it and move on and i, I really like those details um paints a very grim oppressive future as the world with no children would be um yeah just really really good the the long take stuff and they're not true oneers they're not true one long takes you know there's hidden with editing but i don't think that takes away from it at all i think that makes it more impressive because you can't tell where the seams are and i think at the end of the day it's the final product that matters and as impressive as things as impressive as it can be to do one really long take um on set or on the day or do really impressive things in camera as long as it works in the final product that's what's impressive to me um so yeah the one is all look really really good um the, the landscape the film paints is fantastic it's this bleak oppressive future where people are trying to keep hope but kind of failing um yeah fantastic film uh probably easily yeah easily the best thing alfonso curon's directed um uh, most of his other stuff that i've seen has either been uh just a bit too focused on the visceral elements of it and doesn't nail the pathos in the way that this film does um or it's harry potter and the prisoner of azkaban which <laughs> you can't really enjoy outside of harry potter um well actually of all of the of all of those harry potter films that is the one you can enjoy the most outside of harry potter um but yeah anyway children of men great film great post-apocalyptic film uh highly recommend chinatown um one of the all-time classic neo-noir films when I first watched this, it was one of those things, I, I kind of bought it on faith, which I don't do too much these days. These days I like to watch a film, decide if I really like it, and then I go out and buy it, which is because in the past I have bought things that, I bought things on faith and I just did not enjoy them at all and immediately resold them and it was a waste of time and money. But I bought this on faith and I was a little worried when I started the film. And I was like, oh, maybe this doesn't hold up. Maybe it's on people's lists because of the era of the time and the importance of it. But by the end of it, I was so gripped. The way it weaves the mystery, the way it, the direction it sends both you and Jack Nicholson's, Jack Nicholson's character, yeah, the journey it sends you on, the, the, the misdemeanors, the misdirections, you're pulled this way and that. It, it's fantastic. It's incredibly bleak. <laughs> like, Everyone knows, you know, the, the final line, you know, forget it, Jake, it's Chinatown, you know, it's in pop culture, you know, it's one of those things I absorb passively, but I didn't know the context of how it was said and the way it is actually said is like, God damn, this movie is paints, paints a bleak picture of LA. <laughs> um, it's really, really good. It's a really gripping mystery, gripping detective story. Um, yeah, it, it kind of succeeds on, on almost every front. Um, it is one of those things you can sort of see some of the sexist attitudes of the time, and by the time I mean both the time it's set in, you know, the, the 30s, uh, but also uh, the time it was shot, i.e. the 70s or the 60s. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but then at the same time, it, it's also going into how those sexist attitudes hurt 
people. And this is problematic. This is the hellish world that these people live in. The, this one woman in particular, the way this film, this the way this film sets up the femme fatale character, only for her to be revealed to be just the worst victim in everything, in every possible sense, is great. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, incredible film. Uh, it is like a lot of things in my collection. You may have gathered I like I like films that are really bleak and make you feel horrible. This film is bleak and makes you feel horrible, so be prepared for that. But if you want to watch one of the all-time classic neo-noir films, this is a fantastic place to start. Orson Welles' Citizen Kane. You have to say Orson Welles' Citizen Kane because Orson Welles is, is this film. Written, directed, starred, and produced by him. Um, it's... You know, it ends up on people's lists of all-time best films for a reason. I can't really say anything new about Citizen Kane. Like, this, like, of all the things in my collection, this, most of all, what can you really say about Citizen Kane? I think even if you're not really a particularly big film buff and you can't quite get into older movies the way, say, people interested in film and film history can, like, say, for example, you know, there are some films from this era that I watch, and I don't like them, but I can appreciate how important it was for the time. This film, I think... You can watch it and still enjoy it because it's just well made. It's put together. It's, it's incredibly well put together. Um, though personally, I think Orson Welles' opus is the the Frozen Peas commercial, the radio commercial he did in his Twilight years when he's drunk and he goes on a drunken tirade about how low he's fallen from having the most well-regarded film of all time, doing a radio advertisement for Frozen Peas. I think that's the best thing Orson Welles was involved with. Or the Transformers show, because that's really funny. But... If you haven't seen Citizen Kane uh, and you've been worried about watching it because of just the sheer amount of praise it's been getting, I'd say still watch it. Um, it probably won't live up to this mental picture in your head as the greatest film of all time, but it's still a really good film and I highly recommend it. So now we have The Double and unfortunately and ashamedly, this is the only thing in my Blu-ray collection that I haven't watched yet. I bought this on Faith in a clearance sale. Madman clearance sale actually when I was mostly buying anime but this was five bucks and I'm a fan of Richard Iowati. Um I really like um, a lot of the TV shows he's directed. Garth Marenghi's Dark Place uh, is a fantastic fantastic parody of like the type of schlock like Stephen King TV adaptation schlock shows that people try to pass off as really artistic. Excellent show I really like that. Um and I've seen a little bit of Submarine, and I really like that. I need to get back to that as well. So I bought it on Faith and Loan. I haven't watched it yet. Uh, I think my good friend Gil Lies here, though, has seen the double. So if you want my thoughts on it, ask him, because he will be stepping in for me until I have uh, seen it for myself and I'm able to give a more concrete, concrete opinion on it. So direct all complaints to uh, youtube.com slash Gil Lies here, uh, and he will take anything that you send to him. Really, he'll do anything for money. That guy's crazy. Now we move on to Enemy. And it's funny that the double and Enemy are next to each other alphabetically in my collection because from what I can gather, they're very similar films. Um, although I've actually seen Enemy, which is the biggest difference. And this is uh, in my top five. I think I own everything in my top five, which is good. And I'll probably reveal them all as I go along throughout this video. Um, this film is incredible. This is... The first movie of Denis Villeneuve that I... No, actually, I watched Prisoners first, and then I watched this, and this blew me away. I love this film. This film is incredible. It's... As I've said multiple times now so far, I really like bleak, oppressive atmospheres in film. And this film nails it. It nails the sense of, of paranoia and just disorientation, not knowing where you are, not even being aware of what your own potential actions may have been. The basic premise of the film is that uh, Jake Gyllenhaal is a professor of uh, history, I believe. Yeah, professor of history. And he discovers one day that there is an exact double of himself living a life, leading a life as an actor. And it's like the hunt to, the journey of hunting him down and then hunting him down, figuring out exactly what the hell is happening and why they're like this. It's a very non-literal film. I don't think it's particularly obtuse. I think the ending happens and you're like, what the fuck was that? Uh, and it also makes you poo your pants if you've got a particular phobia that I do, which is an unfortunate phobia to have to also be living in Australia. Um, but 
once you think about it and once you sort of analyze it and go over it's not that it's not that hard to figure out i think what's happening in this film uh it takes a little bit of time but it's it's certainly it's not 2001 a space odyssey level without a doubt but cinematography is amazing it makes um toronto look like the concrete hell bunker that it is uh these horrible just hideous mustard yellows everything is bathed in this gross yellow it's perfect it's so good um, the way this film looks is just so sleazy and disgusting and and um, disorienting, which is exactly what it wants to do. The poster sucks for this DVD cover, like I was talking about earlier. Australia, we get the worst covers. The American cover, the American release, or the North American release, because this is a French-Canadian film. The North American release has two really, really good covers, and either of those would have been so much more preferable than this piece of hunking shit like what does this tell you about the film nothing that jake gyllenhaal is stuck in a fucking shitty lens that needs fixing for its chromatic distortion um <coughs> but yeah i love this film uh fantastically paced fantastically plotted amazing soundtrack brilliant performances um the way that they the camera is not still which is fantastic um because you know you would think the fact that jack gyllenhaal is playing two characters or on screen at the same time you'd think yeah they just lock the camera off cut the screen in the middle and that's it no they interact the camera moves all the time it's very dynamic um it's fantastic the way they filmed the the two of them being together um yeah brilliant uh highly highly recommend i don't want to actually say too much about the story and where it goes because it's one of those things i think that is it is best uh, experience for yourself. Um, if this kind of sounds like the, your type of thing, a psychological mustard nightmare, then I um, highly recommend it. I really love it. And if you decide to get the Blu-ray, please, for my sake, get the one that has the better cover than this piece of fucking shit. So now we have Green Room. This is the third film from Jeremy Solana, who quickly, quickly became one of my favorite directors. I loved the film he did before this called Blue Ruin. They have no, um, no link. Um, uh, except for like a couple of, you know, just recurring actors, or whatever, but they don't, it's, it, they're not linked in any capacity apart from just directorial style. Um, I think I prefer Blue Ruin to this, but this is still, this is still an amazing film. What I like about this film is how contained it is. It almost entirely takes place in the same building, or at the very least around the lot of the same building. There's only one scene that doesn't take place on the lot. Um, and it's just sort of a locked in a room, how do we get out of this scenario? Uh, it's basically just a punk, uh, basic premise is a punk band, they're touring, they're not doing particularly well because they're in love with the punk lifestyle or what punk used to be, and they end up uh, playing at a bar full of neo-Nazis, and through circumstance they witness a murder, and they're basically stuck in the green room, uh, trapped in there, knowing that if they leave they'll be killed by the neo-Nazis, and it's really tense, it's really, <clears throat> it's, yeah, it's just a sort of locked in a room, how do we get out of here sort of scenario. Um, the, the way they, um, I like the way this film denies character arcs as well. Cause like, there's a, there's a very simple, tiny thing of like, you know, what's your desert island, what's your desert island album, which is like the album they'd take when they'd be on a desert island. And at the beginning, they all say something, you know, oh, really punk and yeah, hardcore. And then midway through the film, most of the characters reveal their true Desert Island album, which is like really poppy and, you know, sort of guilty pleasure type things. But the main character can't reveal his. Um, and then at the very end, he he goes to, uh, but the, the way it's sort of, it sort of played off is, I, I won't spoil it too much, even though I basically said the whole thing, but I'll leave the punchline for the end if you haven't seen it. But it's just indicative of the way that this film is basically like, y yeah, th there's no there's no room for like, oh, we're growing as a people, we're becoming the best, we overcame the challenge, everybody, and now I'm a better person. It's just like, no, this is a shitty situation, you're going to have PTSD for the rest of your life if you even get out of here. There's none of that. Um, I also like the way that um, Patrick Stewart's character, because Patrick Stewart plays the head of the neo-Nazis, and I like the way that he is clearly, his character is kind of, sad in a way because he's clearly a more a fairly intelligent man but because of his horrible beliefs he's stuck with people who have he's stuck with just the people who would the only people who would share those beliefs which are raging idiots so you can you can clearly tell he's far more intelligent but you know he's he's just stuck with these fucking racist losers because of his own racism and that's great i think that's a great character um yeah really good film um i also like the fact that they don't get mad like that they play 
at, at the show they play the punk band plays uh dead kennedy song nazi punks fuck off which I'm, I'm a dead kennedy's fan so i really i appreciated that wow well i'm throwing out my own reference look how cool my taste is appreciate the, my my like of punk music <laughs> um but that's not what actually pisses them off, which I think is in, which I think is nice. It's just the fact that they witness a murder. Because I think even neo Nazis in real life aren't like, "Hey, you said something mean to me. I'm gonna fucking stab you," you know. So, um, yeah, really good film. Uh, really solid, contained. Again, incredibly bleak and depressing film. Um, I'm glad I own a Blu-ray. Uh, recommend it if that's your bag. The Grey, starring Liam Neeson. Um, I remember when this came out, like in 2011, 2012, and the trailers, it's one of those cases where I think the marketing were trying to advertise the film to the wrong crowd. Because I remember the trailers made it seem like Taken, but with wolves. You know, like, Liam Neeson is badass, he fights all the wolves and then he fucks abroad. I don't know. I haven't actually seen Taken. But that's what the trailers made it look like, just generic action film. And then I remember I watched this at my friend's place and I was really impressed because it's not that at all. It's this... um it's just this, like, long, slow nightmare of the fact that they're outnumbered, they've got no weapons, they're stuck in the Alaskan wilderness, no one's coming to rescue them, they're fucked, they're gonna die. And I, I was really impressed, it's this really, like, it's basically a horror film with no main villain, where the threat is nature, and not nature in a sense of, you were pissed off nature, we're gonna get you, you shouldn't have been dumping that oil it's just nature in the sense that a lot of conditions on earth aren't habitable for humans and this is one of them and the way they play the wolves too is that the wolves aren't just nasty because they're wolves it's because they're near their den and the wolves are trying to protect these outside threats um yeah and the gray is like what it says it's, it's a film full of characters who don't fall into black and white morality one of them is kind of an absolute scumbag but they're stuck in this fucking winter hell with no way to get out and Liam Neeson's character is just this depressed loser with nothing left in the world there's a great scene after the plane crash because basically the premise is they work on an oil rig in Alaska they're being taken back um, to the mainland um, uh, contiguous United States and their plane is down and there's a scene where there's a character's like you know freaking out and he's bleeding and Liam Neeson's character comes down and it's like calm down breathe look you're just gonna die <laughs> it's just like shit that's the tone of the film established um also i have a bit of a bias because i love snow i think snow is along with rain snow is one of the most cinematic things there is if you have uh, a set a film with a scene set in the snow i'm in i'm in i, I just like the way like a like a fucking alaskan forest covered in fucking eight feet of snow and like a tiny decrepit abandoned house i'm sold um, maybe the reason I like snow is because I live in a country where there's basically zilch unless you go down super south and into the mountains, but I like snow. I think it's very, um, it's very aesthetic and very filmic. So maybe that's why this film, uh, surprised me as much as I did and why I liked it as much as I did. But, um, I think, and I don't want to stress, it's not an amazing film, um, but like it's, there's not much going on below the surface, but what's on the surface is very rich and very gripping, very... You know, it just, it, it understands of what it needs to do, where these characters need to go, which is nowhere, because they're fucked, they're stuck here. Um, if that sounds like your thing, then I highly recommend checking it out. It's nothing like what the trailers made it out to be. So now to talk about another film that is stacked in my favor for liking it because of the setting it's in, The Hateful Eight, which is in the same type of environment, and it's basically picture perfect for the type of setting for a film that I would like. But when I first saw it, I saw it under sort of suboptimal conditions. I did see it in the theater, but the audience was full of... The audience had two elements that kind of tore me in the wrong direction. The first was I went to see it with two friends who really do not like Tarantino films. They don't like his style, they don't like his content, they just didn't like it, and so I was sitting next to them feeling that they didn't like it. The other element was that the people in the audience <laughs> were people who like Tarantino films, but for the wrong reasons. For They were the type of audience who, when a character would say nigger, and then you just hear fucking some guy in the back go, hua, 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 hua. nigger, that's the word for black people. Well, they obviously didn't say that, but you know, 
basically that's the type of crowd. I remember during the intermission, you know, after all this slow build up, I heard someone shout, now we get to the good stuff. And I was like, oh, Jesus. So we didn't see it in terribly good conditions. Um, but I thought I'd give it another shot. So when I got it on Blu-ray, because I knew at least I loved it visually because that was, I could see that on the big screen. It was fantastic. And I loved this soundtrack. I knew I loved that as well. I think this is one of the best soundtracks of a film in recent years. The soundtrack is amazing. Morricone is a genius. I'm glad he finally got an Oscar or at least a nomination. I can't actually remember if he won it, but he got some for this finally. And I'm glad that Tarantino, it wouldn't have fit to have, you know, like hip hop or Tarantino's usual shtick of using music from the zeitgeist in here because what music from the zeitgeist can you put in here so i'm glad he finally went that with a proper score um so apart from that i thought i'd give him another chance when i bought it on blu-ray and thankfully when i watched it by myself at home in the right conditions i was able to enjoy it i like it i don't think it's a particularly amazing film i don't think it's even the best tarantino film by any respects but i think it is a good film i like the fact that it's basically just within the same Again, it's the same thing of locked in a room, the same location. It's in a location that's sort of pre-stacked, stacked in the odds, stacked in my favor for me to liking it. It's aesthetically beautiful, and I like the just figuring out who's on my side, who's the culprit, who's doing what. I like all that stuff. Um, the performances are really good. It is a little bloated, um, and parts of it do sort of feel like an RPG, walking into a bar and asking every single patron what they know about the fucking Reaper's but I don't mind that and uh, yeah I'm glad I own it I think it's a really good film I'm glad I gave it another chance um if you like the setting of snow like I do and you like what I've described then I should recommend checking it out um it, it is quite especially towards the end Tarantino can't really seem to control himself he likes seeing heads explode in geysers of blood which is unfortunate because i think that's going to stop him from growing beyond what he is now which is very competent at what he does but that's about it um so if you are like my friends who i went to see it with and you're not really a particularly big fan of tarantino this probably isn't going to change your mind but if you're all right with tarantino and you like yeah the the prerequisites which i just mentioned then i think you'll enjoy this film now we move on to spike jones's her and it's kind of incredible that this movie came out of somebody who was an executive producer on Jackass because this movie is kind of perfect. It's it's so good. Um, I it's one. I honestly, I haven't seen it since I saw it in the theaters. I saw it twice in the theaters, but I haven't seen it since the theaters. But it's so vivid in my memory because just from the visuals alone, this film is beautiful. It's one of the best depictions of a near future I've seen in terms of, well, one, making it feel grounded, like this is a future that could potentially exist. I mean, they just shot it in Shanghai, <laughs> so, I mean, it's a place that does exist. But the idea of this becoming what, uh, you know, sort of the standard for cities will be. Um, the color palette is fucking phenomenal! So good! The colors in this movie is fucking... It's a, usually... Usually I like cooler colors. I like a more of a, I like, I like more of a, you know, a, a muted palette. I like earth tones. Um, I like sort of stark contrast, but this movie is so warm and it's not warm in a, you know, Windows XP background way or just whack an orange filter on it. The color design in this movie is top notch. I, I don't think I've seen a modern film with as good color that, as her does every fucking frame is so balanced whether it's using complementary colors tritonal color comp like oh, oh the colors the color is honestly my favorite part of this film and this movie looks so goddamn good but <laughs> even like with the content obviously the emotional core of the story it treats itself seriously it's this idea of, well, okay, if AIs are developing at such a rate, what happens when someone wants to date one? And it's not like, a <laughs> losers dating a robot kind of thing. It's genuinely like this is a potential scenario if, a, if a, a robotics and AI get to that point. And what's the moral standpoint to take? And it sort of takes that, well, depending on how AIs and robots become, they, you know, how much do you measure them as an actual human? And it's a tough question. And the film kind of skirts the bigger, broader implications. It just sort of focuses on the idea that it would be okay 
for the individuals to do this sort of thing. They're not lesser, they're not worse for doing that sort of thing because if they get to the point that they're like a human, aren't they a human? And I think it's really sweet. It's a very sweet film. And the direction it goes, it, it also looks in the, how that sort of relationship, what sort of problems would that relationship have? Because it's just like any relationship, you know? There's the honeymoon phase where you think, oh, this person, this person's the one. This person's the one who's going to, to lift me up that we're going to live our lives together. We're perfect. We get along. We have everything in common. But every relationship has its problems. Every relationship has its the things it needs to work through. And this, it just happens to be that it's, she doesn't have a physical body. <laughs> There's a fantastic scene where, like, she arranges to have, like, a woman come in and, like, with a little ear. I'm just thinking about that. I need to rewatch this film before I leave and put it away because I, I haven't seen it since it came out. And it was so good. Yeah, if you haven't seen her, if you, like, didn't know what it was, um, you know, if you didn't know exactly if you're going to enjoy Joaquin Phoenix dating a robot, or if you weren't a fan of Spike Jones, or for whatever reason, I highly, highly recommend you watch it. This movie is amazing. So good. Just for the color. Like, if you're an artist, if you're a visual artist, <laughs> watch this film and be amazed at how goddamn good the color grading is in this movie. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. Good film, please watch it. It Follows. It Follows is the type of movie that I think a particular type of person would shouldn't watch. Um, it's, a, it's a type of person that if you watch movies in general and you're this particular type of person, I don't really know why you watch movies um, because they're kind of, it's movies are inherently against what it is. But if you're somebody who when you watch a film and there's a discrepancy like, uh, you know, oh, like, oh, so-and-so, the curse of blah, 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 you know, means that they can only be intangible, you know, when they're in contact with the Sozetta Stone, but then in this scene, they weren't in there, and they just did it, so the movie, shit, plot hole. If you're that type of person, you would hate this film, because this is a film, the laws and the rules of the creature, of the monster, are disregarded all the time in ways that are pretty blatant and ways that I think even people who aren't that pedantic would be like, shit, that's pretty, pretty broken. Because essentially the premise of the film is that uh, it's a creature that uh, if you have sex with somebody, it's basically an STD monster. You have sex with somebody and then this creature will follow you around and will always be moving towards you to kill you unless you have sex with somebody else and transfer it to them. But this thing is standing still all the time, all throughout the film. And it's doing things it cannot do all throughout the film. Um, so if that bugs you, just straight up don't watch this film. If it doesn't, and you're the type of person who can let the cinema of it, can let just the the ideas and themes wash over you without thinking about the internal consistency, or even thinking about the external consistency, then I think you really like this film, because this film is really good. It's really well shot. It understands the zeitgeist and the timepiece. The era of film, it's trying to harken back to sort of, you know, I mean, obviously a lot of things are doing this now, harken back to the 80s and the 80s sort of horror. But it's doing it in a bit of a more interesting way, because it's not saying it's set in the 80s, because people are also have like weird tablets, and they're watching weird... It's just a weird version of you're not sure what time period this is set in. Um, but stylistically, it's trying to throw back to that. Lots of these long takes just sort of sitting there. The score by Disaster Piece. Um, it's really good, really great, thrilling, chilling, billing, ceiling, dilling. <laughs> Why do I do this? Really good score. Really great uh, electronic, um, unnerving, unnerving pieces of music throughout this. Um, performances are really good. The concept... The concept is strong and the individual scenes are great. And even the moments that do break the rules, you know, I'm conflicted on. Because I you know, I can understand that as much as I was picking on them before. I can understand if those things bother you in film. Because when you watch something, you want to think that the people who made this put their effort into making it. And I can, you know, I can look past um, magic. I can look past creatures and the supernatural, you know. It, it's usually when it comes to interacting with... Uh, things that I interact with, you know, every day. Um, but, you know, there are moments where it does break. Like, for, for instance, there's a, there's a shot where she's driving past and uh, she sees the creature standing on the roof. is like in the form of a naked old man because it changes form depending on what you're looking at it, So which is the creepy part because it could just be anybody coming towards you. Um, but she sees it and there's a naked old man standing on the roof just staring at her as she drives away. And it's, I'm conflicted because I'm like, damn, it's a really good shot. It's really creepy. 
how to get on the roof why is it just standing there though <laughs> you know because then if if the the logical in the the part of your brain that's thinking about the the logic of the film we go well that's not the creature that's just some that's fucking old mate brian who lives down the road he's just standing on his roof with his wang out looking at you um so i can understand if that would affect you but when i watched this film it's just one of those things where I just have to focus on the artistry and how it was put together and the individual elements of the filmmaking rather than thinking about it as uh, in- an internally consistent story. Because it isn't. It's a very inconsistent story. But I think that those construction elements make up for it and uh, hopefully it will for you too if you haven't seen it. So now we have a little known film franchise called uh, The Lord of the Rings. This is uh, one of the few things I'll be showing that I have on DVD today because um, it's a pretty prominent part of my collection. You can see, you can see there in these massive boxes, but also because Lord of the Rings are, it is a pr- plays a pretty prominent part in my uh, desire to know more about filmmaking because this was another one of those game changer moments when I saw these when I was a kid. Um, you know, when I first saw the Fellowship of the Ring, and I was just thinking, how the fuck did a human being create this <laughs> um and yeah i just also want to show because i like i like the packaging i would eventually like to get these on blu-ray because i think that would be amazing but for the moment i'm fine with the dvd quality this is the extended edition super big deluxe ultra cool guy big boy box so it has all three films in the extended edition uh and then it has special features so essentially there are 12 discs uh each movie has four discs to it the first two discs of each are for the film, and the second two discs are for uh, the special features. So there's a lot of fucking content in all these, and I have watched all of it. Um, I am a pretty big fan of Lord of the Rings. I like the books as well, but I like them for different reasons. I think the books are the books are a little better at the lore and the world of Middle Earth, whereas the films are better at the sort of emotional crux of the story and delivering a visual landscape i mean obviously visual landscape but even just the landscapes i think are fantastic in this film the books are fucking weird like the in the book is a character who will never cease to be baffling to me because called tom bombadil who's the character they meet in the fucking old woods who's just like yeah I'm, i'm immune to the ring check out how hot my wife is and then they're like, oh, cool. And they're more fucking interested in his hot wife than the fucking fact that this dude is immune to the ring. And then the Council of Elrond, Council of Elrond when they're discussing what they're going to do, like, could we involve Tom Bombadil? And they're like, no, he's beyond such matters or some shit. And it's like, Gandalf, you just don't want to talk to him, do you? He beat you in a drinking game once, didn't he? Like, why Why not go get this guy? Maybe he'll do it. I think Tom Bombadil is supposed to be like, oh, there are parts of this world that even the creator, Edu Iluvatar, because he's supposed to be there. Tom Bombadil was supposed to have always been in Middle Earth rather than all the other creations of the God and then the Valar and everything like that. Am I boring you yet? This is too nerdy. <laughs> um, but yeah, Tom Bombadil's not in the movies, uh, which is good. A lot of the changes from the books to the movies, I think, are for the better. Some of them aren't. Some of them are a bit bad. Um, there's a bit too much focus on action in the movies. I think that's something that when I look back at it, and when I rewatched them recently, I didn't really love most of the action scenes. Some of them were really good. Usually all the best action scenes were with the hobbits in the Fellowship of the Ring or in some of the later ones where they're shit useless because they're hobbits and they just got to escape. I think those are the, like when the hobbits are running away from the Nazgul, uh, trying to get to the fairy. That's really good. Um... So, but like, you know, seeing Legolas kill a bazillion dudes isn't really entertaining for me anymore. I think they're a bit overblown. Um, I remember I used to like the Two Towers the most, but I think that's now my least favorite. Um, The Fellowship of the Ring is definitely the most cohesive as a film. And then Return of the King has some of the highest highs, but also some of the lowest lows. There, I, I tend to view them though as one big chunk of, of, uh, of uh, one big story. And uh, a friend who I was watching it with recently, um, did bring up an interesting point that it probably would work better as a serial um just because of the, how much content is in the story and then that would mean that something like the two towers which has some really good parts in it too wouldn't feel as bogged down with all the helms deep shit because then that would just be the all oh, the episodes you don't like rather than a third of the story you don't really like um i do know that they're making a lord of the rings netflix tv show which will fucking suck so fucking be careful what you wish for i never should have said that but yeah, I really like the cases these come in. I'm going to showcase some of this stuff off. Mm-hmm.
I won't do it for all of them because that'll just take too long, but like, I really, like, oh god, look at that shit. Oh, it's so good, you know, just like, and the way they're like, you know, designed to be sort of like books that sprawl out and, uh, um, this is probably in terms of, this is part of the reason why I, I sort of wanted to showcase it off as well is because I just love the way the packaging of this looks. I think it, like, like it's a prominent part of my collection, you know for a very very good reason the, it comes with maps which is really good it came with a map that i have on my wall which i probably won't show you but um uh i i used to when i was a kid i used to judge fantasy books on the fact of whether if they had a map or not and if they didn't have a map i didn't like it <laughs> um which i still do to a degree well not really but i just i really like maps i don't need to show you this is more of one of the reasons why i think lord of the rings stands out to me uh, both the books and the movies, probably the books a little bit more, but the, the movies still so, especially Fellowship of the Ring, is that, you know, everybody thinks of Lord of the Rings as, like, the quintessential fantasy story, you know? Elves, dragons, goblins, you know, dwarves, and high fantasy, battle for the world. And, of course, that's because people have been very influenced by the way that Tolkien's world has been set up. But, by the time of the Lord of the Rings, the world of the Middle-earth is so past its golden age. The Lord of the Rings is almost like, almost like a post-apocalyptic fantasy story, especially the Fellowship of the Ring, because the northern part of the world, the kingdom, the lost kingdom, you know, you know with the fallen king of Varnor, the land of Eredor, past the Misty Mountains and all that shit, there's no unifying kingdom there. It's just little villages and, sh and, um, and groups and settlements that have sort of sprung up, and they're just living out of the, the remains of this, this old lost kingdoms um you know you think like no, obviously the shire was able to exist completely fucking unconquered you know because of this and all throughout fellowship of the rings just great moments of like walking past the ruins of long ancient forgotten kingdoms that have once fallen like i think upon rewatching it my favorite moment or one of my favorite moments in the entire series is in the fellowship of the ring when they're in the boats and they pass by the Argonauts, you know, the giant statues along the, the river that leads into the border of, uh, the border of Gondor. And it's just these two giant statues that are, you know, the remains of a kingdom that w had such a height, you know, the kings of Numenor, and they had such a height of their power, and this is all that's left of them. And there are so many moments like that throughout Fellowship of the Ring where they'll pass, like, you know, a decaying old temple, a decaying old watchtower. Uh, you know, there'll be a head from one of the statues has fallen over and it's cracked and ruined and there's moss and everything cover it. And Frodo's just kind of like, oh yeah, <laughs> and like walks past. And that shit I love. And I think that's one of the, why these films have such a unique vibe compared to a lot of other fantasy stories because of the fact that this is not the height. You know, Gandalf is a relic from this old era. He's just there to see that the age doesn't, end in complete chaos because Sauron isn't even the the most evil big baddie with the he doesn't even have the most destructive capability you know he was the lieutenant of you know Morgoth of um Melkor and uh you know he's nowhere near the destructive capability and all they're there to ensure is that the people don't fucking you know die or enslaved you know he's not the biggest threat the world has ever seen and I really like that because the stories especially fantasy stories do always seem to focus on the biggest threat you know, the big, bad, end-of-the-world calamity, you're the chosen one, you're going to save this. And Lord of the Rings really doesn't. Lord of the Rings, you know, well, for one, Frodo is just the ring-bearer by happenstance because hobbits have no real worldly desires. You know, hobbits, ha hobbits have no real power, so the ring of power can't really corrupt what little power there is in hobbits, and that's sort of, you know, why they're able to resist the ring so much, and that is why, you know, because of Bilbo's happenstance of happening to find the ring, that's why Frodo is thrust into this position. And I think that's really good, that's really interesting, and that's why these films and these stories have had such a lasting impact. Um, and especially, you know, the way that, spoilers if you haven't seen the films, but Frodo isn't able to destroy the ring in the end. You know, the Ring of Power corrupts all, and that makes the Ring of Power, it makes it such more of an actual accomplishment and more of an actual threat to the fact that this thing corrupts everybody, which is why I don't like Tom Bombadil, because he's such a fucking, he's just like, yeah, we'll check out my wife's tits. Um, 
I've, I think with this, I'll have been talking about Lord of the Rings for about 10 minutes, which is far too long. So I'm going to, <laughs> going to cap this off by saying that I feel like if you haven't seen the films, whether it's because you've read the books and you don't want them ruined, or you just haven't been able to get past the hype they've, they've generated over the years, highly recommend watching them because they are still to this day an achievement of filmmaking. And no matter what changes the books make to the structure, to the characters, no matter what the theatrical editions have cut out, because they did have cut out a lot, especially Boromir's character in the theatrical editions is so much weaker compared to how they are in the uh, extended editions, because in the theatrical cut, Peter Jackson and um, Philippa Morin and... Uh, whatever the, Fran Walsh, that's her name, yeah, uh, they decided when they were cutting the film uh, with the, the editor, especially with Fellowship of the Ring, they decided that uh, they were going to cut everything, of, if, if does it tell the story of Frodo and the Ring? If it does, keep it in. If it doesn't, cut it out, which is good for pacing, but bad for all the characters who want Frodo, because that means that they don't get any screen time, and Boromir and Faramir, completely affected by the cutscene. So I do recommend watching the extended editions. It's a, a commitment. It definitely is. But just make it an event. Invite some friends over, have some beer, a weekend, you sit down and you watch it. Or, you know, whatever you want to do. That's just what I do when I watch these films. Um, but I do recommend seeing them because I think they are still an achievement of filmmaking that have not been beaten. The fact that these three films exist, the time that they came out, they still, for the most part, apart from some off-CG, look as good as they did today. I don't think they've been bested. And the Hobbit films can suck my big fucking little chode. I know I said big and little, but I hate the Hobbit films. Hot take. Wow, the Hobbit films are bad, but they really are bad. They, they don't understand what the, the Hobbit book is. I've been talking about Tolkien, Hobbit, and Lord of the Rings, Peter Jackson for far too long now. I'm going to end it off. These are good films. I like them, okay? Watch them if you haven't, if you feel like you want to watch a piece of, of film history and understand, and see what the Hobbit is about. One of the most well regarded fantasy stories. Okay, we're doing an intermission now. Bye, 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 bye. Okay, yeah, I'm not going to do that joke too long again because it's already played out and I'm already losing time because the sun is going down. Um, I'm only halfway through my film collection of Blu-rays and uh, I don't want to have to do the fucked up lighting setup that I did last time at the end. So, we're going to blaze through straight ahead now in true... My Ritalin medication, no, into Mad Max, uh, The Road Warrior. Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, specifically. This is, obviously, as the two implies, the second Mad Max film, and I think it's an improvement in almost every way. Um, and I mean in terms of filmmaking, because it's hard to compare the first Mad Max film with the second Mad Max film, because they do very different things. I like the first Mad Max film for how simple it is, and it's just interesting because you rarely see an almost apocalyptic story. You know, apocalyptic stories are almost either apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic. So I like the fact that it's a society that's almost on the brink of collapse. It's not quite there yet, but you can tell it's 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 coming soon. And they do very different things. But uh, it was George Miller's first feature film, so he didn't exactly know what he was doing, and, you know, he was figuring it out as he went along. And he said those experiences from filming the first Mad Max was part of the inspiration, and he turned it even into the story of doing the second Mad Max. Um, I think this film, a lot of people think that because of Fury Road that Mad Max 2 is obsolete. I heavily disagree because, again, they do different things, and that's what I like about the Mad Max films. They all do different things. Even Thunderdome, even though I don't like Thunderdome, I think it's kind of silly and, you know, too bastardized what the original was it's at least doing something different it's not just doing what you know what worked in in the second one but what i like about this film is and what i like about most of the mad maxes after the first one is it's not really about max he's just sort of a wanderer where he's the lens for us to view this landscape which is basically just rural australia you know people say oh it's the post-apocalypse it's a nuclear apocalypse the world's turned into a desert no, this is just, this is just fucking near Broken Hill, dude, I mean, <laughs> um, sorry, I need to take a swig, uh, sorry to take away from my very gripping commentary on Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, um, I think this film is great, I think it's, it's, it's an example of how to make an action film without skimping on nuance, and I don't mean in the sense that the story is really rich, in 
theme and pathos. What you're seeing is what you're getting, but in terms of filmmaking, it doesn't skimp out on all. It uses every trick in the book. Um, it's very sturdy at setting things up. And I think what is very important of what the Mad Max films understand that a lot of action films don't understand is that action is only as good as the pre-action. What I mean by that is the action scenes only have power and only have weight if the scenes before it that are setting up the reasons for why those action scenes are happening are just as gripping. And Mad Max 2, I think, really nails it because... You know, people think of it, oh, non-stop action, fun, you know, like one big long, you know, people always describe it as one big long car chase, but it's really only the last 15 minutes that are a car chase. There are only probably about five scenes in the whole thing that could be actually considered straight action. Most of the film is pre-action, is setting up what's going to happen for those action scenes, you know? And by pre-action, I mean just sort of things of, you know, people rocking up, you know, like when the uh, Lord Humongous, which I think is hilarious that that's his actual name, and the crew, you know, first appear and they're gearing up and, you know, everyone's jumping on, like, the sentries and they're locking the gates and all that sort of stuff. It's not really an action scene, but the way it's edited and the way it's set up is it's preparing for something and so you feel gripped. And it's really good. And I just like how weird the world of Mad Max is. Like, this is my favorite Mad Max character, which is the Gyro Captain, played by Bruce Spence, who is the skinniest fuck on the planet but this idea of this you know guy who i presume was a farmer before what happens and that's why it's a gyrocopter and just like everyone else he's gone insane but he's been able to survive just because of his weird resources because he had a gyrocopter and he you know he weirdly is able to tame snakes you know and he's such a fun character and adds breathes a bit of life to it and i like the fact that you know that max himself very selfish he's you know super loner you know he keeps you know he like he keeps the gyro captain like locked up in handcuffs for most of the movie which i think is great and you know there and at the end of the film he he largely seemingly helps them out of a desire for revenge you know i'm sure there's a bit of like his you know his burdened his long suppressed humanity coming back up but a lot of it just seems like i want to do this because i want to do this you know our goals happen to align and I think that's great, you know, it doesn't skimp too much on making him, he's the big hero. And, like, obviously he does protect the kid at the end, but that's because they formed a, you know, he can't fully escape it. And, yeah, I think the way that it sets itself up as a sort of folk tale, you know, it, it, it begins and ends with, I you know, it end, begins with, I remember the road warrior, and then it ends with, and that's the last we ever saw of him. And I think that's great. Um, really well-constructed film, really well, really well-paced excellent paced action film a lot of the action is fun and still holds up today except maybe some of the sped up footage of people driving away really fast color palette's really good the design is really good even if it's just sort of like snm biker aesthetic really good fun moments there's some pretty good comedy in this like i really like the scene with the mechanic and his apprentice and they're just shouting things like you know how he's just like you know we got a cracked timing belt it's like we got a cracked timing belt because i know fucking trainees and apprentices would just like that um yeah, um, really good film. I highly recommend. If you've only seen Fury Road and you haven't experienced any of the other Mad Max films, I recommend this and possibly even the first Mad Max if you're up for a bit of, if you're up for a bit of a backstory. Um, so yeah, highly recommend it. Okay, so now we have Fury Road or Mad Max Fury Road. I guess if you want to be pedantic, I could have just said Fury Road and you would have known what I'm talking about. But I felt the need to say Mad Max Fury Road for some reason because I'm a man who likes clarification. <laughs> Fuck me. Um, Fury Road was great. I was very, very pleasantly surprised uh, when it came out. It was a great cinema experience. Um, it was. I think I even saw it in 3D, and I didn't mind the 3D. I think because it's such a, it's such a goofy fantasy film that the 3D sort of effects, like you know, when the truck explodes and the guy with the flaming guitar goes flying towards the camera, you go, "All right, I can accept this." It's kind of impressive that a 70 year old man made a better action film than the majority of like you know. Well, any fucking, you know, even in Hollywood or in, like, in, or anime or anything, you know, like, this is one of the best action films I've seen in a long time. But everyone, of course, already knows that. I don't really think I need to explain too much about why Fury Road was really good. Um, people, and, yeah, I can't think of too much to say on Fury Road. I probably shouldn't be moving the table like this, but for some reason I am, because the focus on my lens is quite sensitive, so if I move it even an inch out... Probably out of focus since you may have noticed a little bit on some of the other videos, but I am sort of running a bit thin on my patience here because the, the my setup has been fucking me up today a lot more than it has previously. Um, so, 
try to actually say something good about Fury Road. Um, it's good. It's a good movie. Um, I like the world it paints. I like that this seems to be a version of the apocalypse that several generations have passed. It's not made clear. The Mad Max films don't really care about continuity. In my mind, I'm just sort of like, the world of Mad Max and the character of Mad Max is basically sort of in a similar situation to, say, Zelda. Before Zelda, they tried to actually say there's a timeline. Before that, it was just like, this is different reinterpretations of the same story, of the same hero, of the same folk hero. Um, and that's how I sort of look at Fury Road, because I see it not as being in the same continuity. This is just sort of like the folk tale version of Mad Max in its different form. And so I like the idea that this is now a post-apocalyptic society that so many generations have passed that a new culture has been brought up and that there are generations that know nothing but this world, which is really interesting. You know, like the War Boys are, you know, really interesting. That the it, it delves into a bit more, I think, pathos, a bit more... Uh, not terribly much, but a bit more depth into the minds of human interaction and narrativity and all that kind of... I don't even think I said words then, but I think there's a bit more going on thematically here than, say, something like uh, The Road Warrior, you know, with the idea of whether, you know, in, in bleak scenarios like this, uh, human beings being treated as property. Um, really good. Uh, all the characters are really good. Furiosa is a really great character, really, and I... I honestly, I'm fine with the fact that because this is now, in order to get the funding, this obviously needs to be co-funded by Hollywood. Can't really just go to Broken Hill anymore and shoot at the back like they did in the old days. Um, so I'm fine with the fact that most of, a lot of the actors in this movie aren't even really doing Australian accents. Um, uh, you know, there's a British one, Tom, I don't know what Tom Hardy's doing, uh, Charlie Strenaut, Char what's her name? Charlie's... Theron? I, I forget her name. Furious is actor. She's not even trying. She's just doing her fucking American accent. And I'm fine with that because, again, this is a folk tale. I don't really need it to be set in Australia. I like that The Road Warrior and uh, the first Mad Max are set in Australia, but I think this one, it doesn't really matter so much. This is the folk fantasy tale of Mad Max. The only thing I don't really like, I'm not a fan of the color palette. I think it's a bit too saturated. I get that's the point. But for my own personal tastes, I do like it a little bit muted. Um, I am interested in watching the Black and Chrome edition. I don't really want to go out and pay for the same movie because I know that George Miller was talking about a version of the film that was black and white and also a version of the film that had no dialogue. And I'd love to see the version of the film that has no dialogue. But unfortunately, only the Black and Chrome edition was released, presumably because it would be a huge amount of work to actually re-edit the film without dialogue. All the sound cues would be off. They'd have to redo the sound design. The budget probably isn't there for it. But... I can obviously, I can make the fucking black and chrome version myself, you know, <laughs> I can just, you know, go into fucking Media Player Classic, desaturate it, boost the, boost the gamma, um, boost the, the, uh, Luma, and then, yeah, but I would be interested to see a movie like that, I think it would very much suit being a black and white, but, yeah, Fury Road, uh, one of the best action movies in recent memories, and, um, I'm really impressed that George Miller is still kicking it, although, personally, I don't think he can top Babe, that's his best film, easily! Now we have The Matrix. Now, when I was a kid, The Matrix was everything uh, to me. I thought it was the dopest shit on the face of the planet, <laughs> which is funny. When I thought when I rewatched it uh, about a year or so ago, or a couple years ago now, that I was not going to like it because everyone told me now that Ghost in the Shell had just ripped it off, and I loved Ghost in the Shell. I mean, it had ripped off Ghost in the Shell. Fuck shit. How do grammar? Um, but... I rewatched it, and apart from the first scene, which doesn't particularly hold up very well, you can tell that the background she's running across is just fucking cardboard. But for the most part, I think it it's pretty good. It's 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 fun. It's a fun visceral action film with that tries to use pop philosophy to give it a bit more flavor. And I don't think there's anything wrong with pop philosophy. You know, I I I don't pop philosophy is obviously employed in a lot of things because pop just means popular. Um. And people enjoy pop culture. So I don't really see any particular problem with that. It is a problem if people start to supplant it as the only philosophy. And I don't actually, you know, think that it's, um, yeah, just use it instead of, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. I haven't actually read that much philosophy myself. But I think it's fine that both, I think, you know, classical literature and classical philosophy and even modern psychosis, modern psychoanalysis, modern psychology, modern philosophy, modern, all the fields that I, I don't know what I'm talking about. 
<laughs> I'll, 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 I'll dial it back a little bit. I think pop philosophy and more classic philosophy can coexist. I think they both have their place, and I think it's fine. It gives it a bit more flavor and a bit more of uh, a point to the story that it wouldn't have otherwise. It would otherwise just be people blowing up. Um, the reason why this works compared to the sequels is the structure and that the ideas aren't as fucking stupid. But I think it's largely just structure, because the action in this one, mostly, there's a brief bit at the beginning, but the action comes at the end, after this long build-up of sort of showcasing the world, the machines, the Matrix, everything like that. Um, comes after this long build-up structure, um, and it's just a more tightly sort of constructed story because of that. Um, the characters are more likable in this, the story isn't so bloated, uh, blah, 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 all the things. People who say that it ripped off Ghost in the Shell, I think need to actually watch the film because it didn't really. It has some visual homages, particularly in the elevator shootout where the way that the pillars are shot looks very similar to the way that the pillars are shot in the museum sequence in Ghost in the Shell. That's about it. I think we're in a bit of trouble if people start calling visual homages ripping it off. Um, because then a lot of fucking media is just a rip-off of everything else, and I don't like to think that way, because total originality is a false idea. Not that you shouldn't strive to be as original as possible, but the idea that something is truly original is false, because you as a person were, con even, if, even if it's not been done before in media, you as a person were constructed by ideas that already exist, so yeah, bucko. Well, it's fitting that talking about the Matrix, I'm making shit up. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> this, is, this is the worst one in my collection. I think it's fine. I think it's fine. I like the Matrix. It's still well constructed. It's fun, visceral, entertainment with a bit of flavor to it that you might not get out of anything else the Wachowskis have ever done because this is kind of a one-hit wonder. The Wachowskis are massive hacks. Uh, v for Vendetta is okay, but... Other than The Matrix, I don't think they've ever really made anything that has garnered itself into the era of either pop culture or even, you know, film aficionados, uh, collective mindsets like The Matrix did. So this is sort of like a self-contained miracle that see it succeeded despite itself and despite the quasi-tipsy Australian man trying to give an adequate description of why he owns it. A lot... Yeah, there's probably a big part of it too that's just nostalgia, but I'm sick of talking about The Matrix. I'm looking at the time. I've been talking about it far too long. It's The Matrix. It's fun visual entertainment. I've said that already several times now, so that's all I'm going to say now about The Matrix. Motherfucking Memories of Murder. This is the third of what I've mentioned of films that are in my top five, and it's the closest to actually being my favorite film. I don't think I would ever be able to confidently say something is my all-time favorite, but this comes pretty fucking close. This movie is absolutely brilliant. It's the most expensive single, like, single item Blu-ray that I own because I own some series that are a bit, um, a bit longer. But I think I paid something like forty or fifty bucks for this movie. I bought it, shipped it straight from Korea because I wanted it. I wanted it in my collection. Um, and I like that the apparently Korean Blu-rays come in this clear case. I'm not actually sure if that's Korean Blu-rays, but this one did particularly. And it's a bit thinner than the others. I don't know if you can sort of see that there, but I like it. It makes it stand out since it's such a special film in my collection. Bong Joon-ho is my man. I don't think anyone... Okay, that's a bit of a overblown statement, but Bong Joon-ho really is a master at flipping the tone of a movie without you realizing because this film starts and you think it's a black and it starts as a black comedy it's about um a, some rural detectives uh some detectives in rural korea and the first big it's based on the first big prominent serial killer case in south korea and at first it's sort of like bumbling the top sort of honcho detective comes down from seoul to like you know help them out and for the most part it's a black comedy and it's brilliant black comedy it's so funny i don't think drop kicks have ever been as funny as they are in a Bong Joon-ho film. Um, really good. But then you don't even realize when it happens, but over the course of the film, the tone flips to a 180 to just become like incredibly gripping, incredibly serious. And it's so natural because it's you realize this the seriousness of the situation at the same time 
that the detectives do and you don't even really know you don't notice when the switch happens it's just there and at one point you're like shit this is now a really fucking serious movie um the climax is fantastic it has one of the best closing shots i've ever seen which is only heightened if you know more about the actual real case and the fact that it never was solved you know um, people like to compare it to zodiac which is a fair comparison because you know they're very similar uh um but yeah, no, it's, it's, the final shot is brilliant. I love it. It's breathtaking. Great bookends with the opening of the scene too. And South Korea, I think, I really like South Korean cinema. It's probably my favorite national cinema. Um, I, obviously I haven't seen as many South Korean films as say American films or Australian films. So I'm talking from the perspective of somebody who's really only seen the cream of the crop, the ones that have risen. I've seen a few duds or not as good ones, but even those are the ones that have gained prominence, gained attention in South Korea in order to make it (laughs) known uh, throughout the world. But yeah, South Korean cinema is really good. And I think it's because Korea itself as a landscape just lends itself to film because it's like more so than even say something like Japan, which also exhibits similar things, but it's like urban development crossed with poverty. (laughs) If that makes any sense, you know, um, and particularly at the time period this is set, which was um, around about the 80s, around the miracle of the Han River, you know, so those reforms were happening really quickly. Um, and it sets the political backdrop of that. Like, you just see, like, riots happening in the street and no one comments on it. It's like, yeah, this is everyday life. Um, so, yeah, brilliant film, really subtle use of oneers, of long takes. And, you know, you'll be am- it's amazing to watch the film and realize how many characters are in frame at one point in time, but the frame doesn't feel cluttered? It's really, it's really brilliant. I highly recommend you watch this film. I love it to death. If uh, It's a great introduction to South Korean cinema. Maybe not the best, but it's a phenomenal film. If you're going, if, if you've been watching this video and you haven't seen any of, a lot of the films on here and you're just going to go away and watch one that you haven't seen, Make it this one, please. I love this film to death. I think it's brilliant. I think it's a masterpiece. And yeah, if there's any film that could be con- con- contender for number one, it's this one. Now we have Mystery Road by director Ivan Sen, who is a very interesting director. He's one of my favorite, he's definitely one of my favorite Australian directors, at least. he He's half Aboriginal, so a lot of his films, or pretty much all of his films, deal with the integration of Aboriginal communities with you know, white Australia, basically. Well, I shouldn't say white Australia, but larger Australia and, like, the place that the varying assets, assets, varying facets of the Aboriginal community have within modern Australia. And this film is, uh, this film is no exception. Um, It's not my favorite film of his. My favorite film of his is a film called Beneath Clouds, which is excellent. If you could find a copy, I'd really recommend it and tracking it down. That, I think, of all of them, that deals with the Aboriginal issues and Aboriginal rights parts of his films the best. This is sort of just more set to the backdrop of rural Australia. Um, Basically, it's an Aboriginal detective who is sort of a little bit ostracized by both parts, both from the sort of Aboriginal community he came from that lives in poverty, who now think he's part of the problem, and the sort of detective force who think he's, you know, a bit over his head and, you know, probably also racism involved. And he's just trying to track down the the killers of, uh, of some girls who've been found on the highway. And it's just, it's just a very solid, slow-burning film about how fucking miserable rural towns really seem, you know? A lot of the time, rural towns in fiction are sort of shown with, you know, this nostalgic quality to them, and, oh, remember how simple life used to be, or let's go back to that, let's move out of the big city and all that kind of shit, but having been, in, especially in rural Australia... Don't know exactly where this is. I think this might be Queensland, which is the state I'm in, but like real real rural Queensland. I've been in those towns. They're miserable. Everything's fucking brown and dying and it's just open land with no one there and the houses are decaying. It's fucking miserable. And it portrays that really well, portrays his struggle to connect with his community and his family in particular. It's not terribly overt. Um, but it's there, the, the Aboriginal issue side. But, you know, he's struggled to connect with his family while staying on the job. Um, and again, it's a film that I think it deals with deep themes. Not a lot happens in the movie. It is one of those movies where not a lot happens. And it's not very action-packed. Hugo Weaving's character is really good. Uh, Hugo Weaving has a really good performance of someone you think is um, really racist and really problematic, but then 
sort of showing that a lot of those people, a lot of the time, sort of those sort of behaviors come from somewhere else. And that when push comes to shove, they do have morals that are just sort of, you know, their, their words are in a disconnect with their heart sort of thing. Um, yeah, very good film. Had a pretty good sequel called Goldstone, which I don't actually own, um, which I saw in the cinema, which was pretty good. Um, I'd say Goldstone looked a little better, but I'd say this one dealt with themes a little better. Um, I'd say neither are amazing films, but I think they are really, really good films, and I do really like Ivan Sen. Um, and if uh, it's yeah, if you want to expand your library of Australian films you've seen, which I assume for a lot of people is particularly small, this isn't a bad one, though. Uh, there are better ones in my collection, but still a very good film. I'm glad I own it. Up next, we have Nebraska, which is a very, very good film. It's, um, I really like the road movie. Um, I th- it's kind of sad that the road movies died a little bit. It's nowhere near as popular, uh, particularly American road movies, because America, you know, it's a country that was built on the roads. It was built, you know, the, how fucking huge it is, but also how many communities there were. There's just a lot to see on the fucking way. Um, so it's a shame that it sort of died out a little bit, which I think is a little bit to do with urbanization. The fact that people have moved to larger city centers has sort of taken any sort of incentive to, you know, go on the road, because then you just, you know, you gotta, if you've got to get from fucking Pittsburgh to Seattle, you just get on a plane, you know, rather than drive. Um, but yeah, no, really good, really good film. Um, it's a film that's befitting of being in black and white, you know, a lot of the time, oh, excuse me. Woo, that was a bad book. (laughs) <laughs> a lot of the time, modern films that try to be black and white, they don't really seem to have a reason for it. And I don't necessarily mean reason as in like, um, oh, it's it's pretending, you know, it's it's a, it's a throwback to older, uh, it's a throwback to, you know, that time period is trying to be, it's trying to have a, you know, the framing device of actually being a black and white film. I just mean like a reason artistically for it to look like, does it suit the fact that it's black and white? And I think this film does because it's a very candid story. It's very, you know, it feels like it's black and white because of, you know, it's a man whose mental state is deteriorating. If you don't know what the premise of Nebraska is, it's it's an old man who wants to travel across the country to to claim a winning lottery ticket. And the rest of the family's like, what the fuck? You got Alzheimer's. You're, you're not going to make it. And so the, the kid goes with him. Um... And it's befitting of that because it reflects the sort of mental state of the characters. It reflects the tone, you know, this sort of, you know, it's it's mostly a pretty, pretty, you know, straightforward drama film, but there's a bit of dry wit in there as well. Um, but yeah, it reflects the mental state of the characters, the tone of the film, and just sort of the fact that it's like, this guy's life is, he's pretty much near death. And, you know, I think the black and white, there's not much color in his life anymore. <laughs> so being black and white makes sense. Um, I really love the writing, the characters, the directions. It sort of feels like the. T- it sort of feels like Larry David characters written for drama, is how I sort of interpreted the film because it's sort of you know those sort of obnoxious, ultra neurotic Larry David characters who normally you're supposed to laugh at and they're only able to get away with being that neurotic because it's comedy, but it's played for drama and it works. Um, and you know it, it's got its heartwarming moments. It's, it's touching. Um, yeah, it's a real, it's a really good film. If you missed it, I highly recommend checking out. I really need to rewatch it because I haven't actually seen it since it came out in theaters in what 2013. Yeah, so it's been goddamn near five years since I've seen this. So I'm due for a rewatch before I go. But um, yeah, really good film. Highly recommend it. The Nice Guys. I was very pleasantly surprised by this film. I remember when I watched it, I didn't know it was by Shane Black. I just saw the cover. I saw Ryan Gosling and Russell Crowe and thought, here we go. <laughs> But um, then I found out it was by Shane Black. I heard really good things. And so uh, when I finally watched it, yeah, I was very pleasantly surprised. Um, I don't have that much to say about it other than it's genuinely funny. Um, like the humor really does land. It's a particular type of humor. Like it's very, it's a mix between dry and awkward, which is a good combination for me. I like dry and awkward because I am dry and awkward. In case you haven't, can you can you tell that I'm a little dry and awkward? Uh <laughs> But yeah, no, both performances are really good. I really didn't know Ryan Gosling could portray a character like this because he's quite a spastic <laughs> in this movie. He also has a certain amount of of grace and dignity ever so rarely, but for the most part, he, he doesn't. Um, he's, a, he's a man trying to make it, but he can't because he lacks the capacity, but he has the heart, um, which I didn't know Ryan Gosling could, could play someone like that because I've really only seen him in as... Uh, 
Nicholas Winding Ref and fucking grizzled chiseled jaw man, you know, <laughs> before before this movie. Russell Crowe was Russell Crowe, fuck hell. Russell Crowe was pretty good as well. Um I think one thing this film captures, I don't think many people talk about this, but it captures kids very well. Because kids are kind of idiots, but they're also smart. Kids are people who know enough that know enough about the world to know that it's not a particularly good place, but they don't know enough to really do anything about it or to um, respond in a, in a way that's very nuanced or healthy. Um, because, you know, and everything, anything that shows kids is innocent, they're only innocent to a degree. They're innocent in the sense that they don't know how to deal with life. They're not really innocent, especially like the kids in this age being like, I'm talking like 13, 14 year old kids. Um, you know, like maybe one in 10 kids is like buttered stotch and then everyone else is Stan and Kyle, you know? And, and this film captures that well, you know, because, uh, the daughter, the daughter, uh, of, uh, Ryan Gosling is, is, is very good, very good character. She's integrated into the narrative really well. She does things. She's important. She's independent. But of course she's a 13 year old girl who needs a proper father figure in her life. Um, yeah, really funny film, goes in some good places, captures the zeitgeist of the time really well. It's a pretty good good joke with uh, with seeing the, the ghost of Nixon in the dreams, <laughs> which is funny because Nixon would be alive at the time, but yeah, it's pretty good. Um, yeah, really well, really just solid comedy film that also doubles as like a sort of caper action uh, thing. Highly recommend it if you, if you missed it or you didn't think it was going to be anything particularly special. It is. It's, it's very solid. I'm, I'm very glad I own it. No Country for Old Men. This is the Coen's masterpiece. Um, this is the only Coen brothers... I like the Coen brothers. Um, I've said it up front. I do like them. But almost all of their films I've had the same experience with, which is I don't enjoy the first half. I don't know what it's doing. It kind of seems kind of boring and silly. But then by the end of the second half, I get it. I understand it. It all ties itself together. It's a film that you need to see the whole package to properly experience and enjoy but i didn't have that with no country for old men i loved it all the way through the world that this sets up is perfect um the novel is uh is uh, really good by comic mccarthy um really good and a pretty the film is pretty much a direct translation of the film it's kind of impressive but that sort of southern gothic you know style and aesthetic is transferred very very well into this film this film is beautiful um it's also a film with very realistically smart characters and which is kind of the main villain, Anton Shiger, of course, is one of the reasons why everyone always pra praises this film and he is fantastic and he's a scary villain because he's a competent villain, because he's a smart villain. He doesn't gloat, he just, he has his own weird sense of morality. Um, yeah, and it's kind of tragic because the main character is a smart protagonist too. You know, like, he, when he goes to the hotel, he, you know, like, there's that whole sequence where he goes to the hotel, and he realizes that it's probably actually smarter if I book another room in the hotel, and then there's, you know, double the chance. You know, he, he does really smart things, but the unfortunate reality is he's in a world where he is not the only smart person. <laughs> the villain is smarter than him. In any other type of movie like this, uh, Josh Brolin's character would have gotten away, but in this movie, he's up against someone who's smarter and more ruthless than him, and that's great. The villain's also not impervious because, you know, they have the, you know, the shootout where Shigur gets hurt as well. You know, he's, he's a human being. He's not, you know, he's, he's incredibly scary human being, incredibly competent human being, but he's a human being. And, you know, even at the end in particular, when he gets injured in the car crash, you know, it's, yeah, it just, and I also like the fact that three main characters never meet. Um, I like the way it portrays a sort of dying South or dying America, really, and making, you know, the old ways of the West, all those ideals, if they ever existed in the first place, are completely gone. And I love how abrupt the ending is, you know. Um, um, it's just like Tommy Lee Jones tells that story, and then I woke up, and then it cuts, and it's just, nobody got nothing in this movie. No one got what they wanted, because Chigurh didn't even really want to do it. He, that's just his sense of morality. And the fact that there's barely any music is really good and the music that is in there is so subtle and ambient it's it's an amazing film if you if, if you haven't seen it i highly recommend it i'm saying that to most of the films in my collection which is a what a surprise the films that i purchased the films that i like and i would recommend to people to watch but 
yeah, if you haven't seen any Coen Brothers, I don't know if it's good for a first Coen Brothers film. I'd pr say probably something like Fargo with a big Lebowski is better, or even like Barton Fink or Raising Arizona. But this film is brilliant, and I think if you're if 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 you like film, you should see this movie because it's it's a stunning example of a of a film of a neo thriller. It's it's brilliant. Prisoners. Uh, this was the first Villeneuve film I've seen. I think this was the one. I mean, this was the one that sort of propelled him into the mainstream a fair amount. So that makes sense, you know, because <laughs> as much as I would like to think of myself as you know a quite well-read person who is, is you know a very good taste and is very known in the underground and confined of skill of things, I, I'm just as wanton to the fucking whims of you know marketing and mainstream availability as anybody else. Um, yeah, I'm not a very obscure. My taste is pretty boring, all things considered. This is a good film. I, Funnily enough, as a Villeneuve, all the Villeneuve films I've seen, even though it's really good, I don't have that much to say about it. Um, I think the narrative goes in a very good direction, the twists and turns, the main twists when you sort of realize who you should actually be afraid of is really well handled. Um, both of the performances, Jake Gyllenhaal and um, Hugh Jackman, are both fantastic. Uh, the two mains, um, yeah, they're very tightly scripted, tightly directed, tightly edited, good music, it's a great film, I highly recommend it, but yeah, I think it's probably, I've got the least to talk about it of any Villeneuve film I've ever seen, you know, even something like Sicario, which I wasn't the biggest fan of, I probably would have more to say on it, um, which is, a lot of the time this is the reasons why, I mean, obviously I haven't made too many film reviews on my channel, but... When I review something, it's, I need something interesting to say about it that I feel hasn't really been said before, or hasn't really been said in the way I feel like I should say it. And I can't think of anything that's interesting to say about prisoners, because what I have to say about prisoners is what everyone else has to say about prisoners. So, yeah, um, it's a good introduction to Villeneuve, I think. Um, I'm saying that about everything. Everything is a good introduction to anything. Just watch shit. If you want to watch something, watch it, unless you fucking need story context for it. It's a good film. There are three plothers standing on my shed. They look like they're going to attack the neighbor's dog, which is pretty funny because that thing does not shut up. But then I also feel bad because it's a dog and I love dogs. Um, I'm really struggling to find things to say about prisoners, so I will stop. Prisoners is good. Watch it. Room. Room is a fantastic film with an unfortunate name because everybody will always think... You're talking about The Room. Um, the Room The Room is obviously a better film than Room. I mean, nothing could compare to it. But Room's pretty good as well. <laughs> no, Room's amazing. Room's a fantastic film. Um, Brie Larson, I think... Brie Larson's a fantastic actor. Um, and this is just one of the other stunning examples of, of her work. Um, you know, it basically, if you don't know what this film is about, it's basically a Josef Fritzl scenario where it's, it's a woman is trapped in a bunker... Uh, imprisoned by a man who raped her and she had a child with him but rather than focusing too much on the mother it focuses a lot more on the child well it's from a child's perspective because i shouldn't say it doesn't focus on the mother because it very definitely does but it's from a child's perspective so a lot of those elements like the fact that he's born of rape aren't really explicitly explored or explicitly told to the audience because the child doesn't really know that the child doesn't really understand what's happening um yeah, very, very, and I think an interesting thing about the film is the way it's structured. Only the first half is actually in, and I guess I'll just say straight up spoilers, so if you don't want spoilers for Room, um, just skip to the next one in the thing. But um, only the first half of the movie is actually in the room. Um, they get out really early on, and then the rest of the movie is about adjusting to the life outside. And that, I really love that the film did that because there's only so much you can do with, like, cabin fever and the psychological implications of actually being in there. And I think going into the PTSD of what being in that type of scenario would do to a person is, I think, just as interesting as actually being in that scenario. So I'm really glad that the film does that. Some of the best scenes, like, there's a fantastic scene where her father, um, you're, they're having a dinner and he just breaks and he's like, I can't accept your child. This is, you know, this is a child born of rape. I can't accept it and is ostracized from the family. And it's heartbreaking. And the kid doesn't understand what he did wrong. It's so good. Um, 
fantastic film. If you haven't seen Room, I recommend it. It was one of the best films of 2015. I, I really, really like Room. I just wish the title I could mention without people thinking I'm talking about Tommy Wiseau's ass. Although now that I think about it, like a Josef Fritzelson situation where Tommy Wiseau was the perpetrator would be a far more terrifying film than this could ever be. Up next, we have Seven, which is my favorite David Fincher film. I think it's the only Fincher film that I own. Um, I, I really like David Fincher as a director. I think he's one of the most consistent, high-profile directors still working in modern Hollywood. Um, and I think Seven is the first film that really sort of... His first film that was really well regarded because obviously, you, you know, he worked on shit like Alien 3, which he has disowned, even though um, I, from what I've heard, and I need to go back and watch Alien 3, that it still has its own merits more than people gave it to, especially the, the director's cut. But Seven is a phenomenal film. Um, I think it's it's unfortunate that the, the copycats from Seven um, missed the point <laughs> of Seven because a lot of the films that... Seven opened the floodgates to come through are like, you know, Saw and um, the like, where it's uh, a serial killer with a strange motif, you know, serial killer with a, with a, with a vision and a goal and the detectives trying to find him. It misses the point of that, you know, it focuses on the visceral elements of this film rather than what they imply for the greater the greater implications of the human condition and um, also... The ex especially the what it does psychologically to the people trying to catch this person because this is a bleak film this is easily I think Fincher's bleakest film you know like the ending quote of the film just I love the ending quote where, where, where um uh uh Morgan Freeman I thought, how did I forget Morgan Freeman's name <laughs> holy shit uh where Morgan Freeman said you know he says er earning Hemingway once said that uh the world's a great place and it's worth fighting for. I agree with the second part. It's just like, damn, son. That's kind of, that's fucking brighten up, man. You're bringing punny down. Um, but, I mean, it's a great cap for the, it's a great summation of the philosophy of the film. You know, it's set in a city that um, is either, I think it's implied to be either New York or Seattle. It's always raining. It's always miserable. Um, they're just trying to catch, you know, this serial killer who just is seemingly one step ahead of them. In both in terms of the detective, you know, the crime aspect and also the psychological and the, uh, the you know, the mental aspect of it. And the, the finale scene is fantastic, you know, because especially, you know, seeing Morgan Freeman's character actually get affected is, is just brilliant. And, you know, the way it sets up the human elements of, you know, did I say Martin Freeman? I think I did. Um, <laughs> of... Uh, you know, Morgan Freeman's character befriending Brad Pitt and also Brad Pitt's wife and actually finding a little bit of spark back into his life from his cynical old bastard self only for the finale of the film to happen. Yeah, it's great. Fantastic film. I really love it. Um, probably, yeah, my favorite Fincher film. Shin Gojira. Uh, this movie is fucking awesome, man. I was so impressed when I saw this. Um, my experience with God Lib... God Libba? Good God. My experience with the, the Godzilla franchise is limited to only about four of the films. I've seen the original, the Roland Emmerich one, um, the Gareth Edwards one, and this. So, you know, it's stacked more towards the American release. But when I saw this, I was blown away that this a film like this could exist still. Um, Hideaki Anno uh, is a genius, um, and he's one of the few people I've... I think he's honestly one of the few people who can direct both live action and animation and have them both be brilliant because a lot of the time even directors who will sort of do both tend to do one far better than the other because they'll try to apply their animation brain to live action or they'll try to apply their live action brain to animation. Hideaki Anno understands the strengths and weaknesses of both and how to apply them all while using his the way he ch composes shots and edits. This film is so tightly edited, um, so well paced, goes by in a moment's notice. Um, I really like the structure. I love that the, f the first 15 minutes is sort of like, sort of like satire, sort of like, you know, really poking fun at the, at how the bureaucratic process gets in the way of actually getting anything done, especially in terms of disaster release, relief. But then once, 
shit actually starts happening and the situation is shown to be as grim as it is, the tone really gets serious. And yeah, it's a bit of an emotional roller coaster. Um, unlike, say, the. Um, I, I can't speak too much. I'm not an expert on Godzilla. I know somebody who, who is, who probably won't watch this video, but that's because he's a fucking cunt. <laughs> well, no, he's a busy man. He's got time on his hands. I shouldn't be referencing people who the general audience won't know who I'm talking about, but that's okay because I don't have a general audience. But while the first Godzilla is definitely about the atom bomb, and most of the later ones aren't, they can become more about television and wrestling and tokusatsu and and all sorts of various other things. This sort of, it's not about the atom bomb, but it's more about Fukushima and disaster relief response and how vulnerable Tokyo is in particular, which I think is, is really, really interesting. And it's just, a, it's, it's, it's a fact that a lot, not a lot of Japanese people want to admit, but if Tokyo, Tokyo is going to get hit by something eventually, which is I think why so many pieces of media, not just the fact that most of Japan lives in Tokyo, but why so many pieces of media deal with like the Tokyo fireball because it's this idea of like it's, it's probably going to happen at some stage um but yeah brilliant film incredibly well shot incredibly well directed the way the music is incorporated is brilliant because it references just about everything but it also works in its own capacity so a lot of the stuff I got I was like holy shit this is amazing and the stuff I didn't get I didn't probably didn't even know it was a reference because I just thought it was music made for the film. But considering the fact that it was using the original Godzilla score, um, it was using fucking shit from Evangelion. Like when Decisive Battle started playing, man, the first time I had a four day erection. It was quite bad. The doctors had to drain the blood from you know, the urethra. It was, it was really nasty. This is what only a beer and a half does to me, by the way. Um, yeah, incredibly well shot, the color palette, everything. There's only one flaw in this movie, in my opinion, and that is the actress who plays the aid, the US aid, because they're trying to sell her as being a Japanese American, and she can't speak English for shit. She has a horrendous accent, and also her character is a little bit annoying and ultimately kind of unnecessary. I kind of get why she's in the movie. One for star power, because apparently the actress is quite a big quite a big star over in Japan. And the other, I think, is because Anu likes that type of character. Anu likes having a sort of feisty, tsundere, you know, foreign girl. You know, obviously did it with Asuka, he done it with uh, what's the face in Gombuster. He does it a lot. Um, so I, I sort of, and which is, you know, I, I think a, a Japanese friend of mine even said that, you know, why she didn't like the character, it was refreshing to see a character like that in a major film, because that sort of character isn't honestly seen that much in uh, in in Japanese live action films, well, from what this person has told me anyway, it's probably just a personal anecdote, and I shouldn't put the, uh, shouldn't be using my Japanese friend as a way to justify my opinions on Japanese media, my name is not Goat Jesus. Um, <laughs> yes, got him. <laughs> I'm probably not going to have time to edit this out if I want to release this before New Year's, so you're sticking with this shit. Hopefully, nobody starts drama. Anyway, if you haven't seen Shin Godzilla, I highly recommend it. The design, Godzilla is absolutely fucking terrifying in this, and they paint him, and it's not through painting him as malicious, because he's clearly just a creature trying to survive that's destructive but the eyes like when first godzilla first shows up he's like this creepy weird bug-eyed thing um that can barely move and then as it starts to rapidly evolve it becomes even more just like this impenetrable wall slab and even at the end of the film they haven't even permanently i oh, shouldn't spoil <laughs> the film watching godzilla it's amazing it's one of the best films i've seen one of the best films I've seen in a long, long time, and it's debatable uh, whether, because I've actually realized that the fifth example, the fifth film in my top five films, I don't own, but that's because I'm not sure if I actually have a fifth, so this is honestly a strong contender. Well, okay, this is this is not if I'm including some of the anime films, because some of my anime films would definitely be like something like Ghost in the Shell would definitely be in my top five, but if I'm leaving it to solely live action then the shining um or as whenever i look at it thanks to the simpsons the shinning is what i always think um because i think 
the Simpsons parody of The Shining is more ingrained in my brain than the actual Shining is. The Shining is a good film. Um, it's again another one of those films where I don't really have anything to say about it because what could I really say about The Shining? Jack Nicholson is fucking terrifying. I think it's a film that I understand people, some people's complaints about it and why it received mixed reviews at the time because it very definitely, I cannot for the life of me understand why someone like Jack Nicholson's character would marry someone like Shelley Duvall's character. That's part of the reason why the film is so terrifying. So it works. It definitely works because, you know, she's this frail wisp of a woman and he's like a deranged loser. Like he was a, probably like the star quarterback in high school and then he just fucking did nothing. So it works, but like it doesn't particularly feel grounded. Again, I'm not going to say realistic. The neighbor's dog is, dog is whining. Maybe the plothers really did go after him. Oh, dear. Um, but... It's not realistic, but again, films don't need to be realistic. And this film is terrifying probably because it's not realistic. I mean, what's... When people complain about that, what's realistic about the doors opening up and the fucking blood, you know, flying through? And of course, you know, like, people, you know, people don't experience supernatural every day and people do talk to people every day so they know when that happens. But I think that is... I love love that dog. I think that is why it's working. I think that is is why it works is because this is a couple that shouldn't be together you know um yeah uh f- great film uh i it's one of those films it's it's i think the reason it works is because kubrick did actually fucking torture she- shelly duvall and jack nicholson and that's why they're in the state they are like they did some according to legend according to myth aka the imdb trivia page which i'm pretty sure i got this fact and then every or least where the things where i've read it got that fact so it might not be true um because i never actually watched any of the, d- the documentaries on the shining which i should i should watch more documentaries i'm just like the last one this is really degrading the longer i go on um but um the rumor is that they did upwards of like a hundred takes of the scene where she finds the um where she finds the typewriter and all all work and i play makes jack a doll boy uh, and if I did a hundred takes of one scene, I'd be I'd be Shelley Duvall as well. And you look at pictures of Shelley Duvall now, and you're like, damn, damn, how much of that is fucking psychological or fucking <coughs> psychological scars from Kubrick? Um, but uh, you know, as unfortunate as her sort of life turned out, I think her performance in The Shining, I, I think he, she's a better performance than Jack Nicholson, honestly, because Jack Nicholson's just a scary fucking dude. He's scary in anything he is. Her performance is really what shines <laughs> uh, in The Shining. Um, so yeah, great film. Uh, can't really say that much about I think I've actually said a decent much about The Shining, which is good. I'm, I'm worried that I'm not going to, but then i got to remember that I waffle on forever about nothing, so I shouldn't be worried about making time. I should be worried about cutting down time. So yeah, The Shining. Uh, great film. Holds up. Still really good. Not my favorite Kubrick film, but it's I see why it's many people's. It's great. Now we have Snowtown, which would be another contender for that fifth spot in my top five. I, it's really funny that I said very confidently, yep, my top five, and then now I've realized I actually don't know how to fill the, the fifth the fifth spot. This is a very fun, happy film. Uh, it's full of love and sunshine, and it's very heartwarming. If you're feeling really down and you want to pick me up, watch Snowtown. Mainly because it's not a cheery, happy film, and it's the most fucking depressing thing on the face of the planet, and you'll feel your life is so much better after watching this. I love this film. This is... It's one of the best Australian films ever made. Um, It's based on the Snowtown Murders, which was a series of murders done... um, Not actually in Snowtown, but that's where the bodies were found. It was also called the Bodies in the Barrels Murders. It was done by John Bunting, who's one of Australia's most infamous... Um, serial killers and it's a sort of it's a biopic about that and it avoids a lot of the usual biopic cliches and trappings um this film is remarkable it's so good um the base yeah it's a basic story is so it's a kid who's from a family who's basically in poverty um the stepdad is you know molesting it's it's a really shitty home situation and the mother gets a new boyfriend called john bunting who's this really charismatic man who for like 15 minutes of the movie seems like he's improving their life you know the main character finally gets a male role model that's a positive a seemingly positive influence on him but then after that about 10 15 minutes it just goes down and you realize this is the most fucked man on the planet and he starts killing 
people at first for being pedophiles, but then seemingly just because you know if they're homosexual, um, and then just down to reasons the people he doesn't like, and it's all and it also a strong element of like scamming them out of their their Centrelink and insurance and um uh, and welfare payments, which which is what actually happened, and it's just an incredibly bleak path down to misery. The editing of the film. It's very disorienting, and at times you can watch it and think like, oh, wow, you know, like, this this scene transition didn't feel very good. It was very abrupt, but it works because it's like an extension of the main character's sort of de-evolution into this lifestyle and the fact that he's not even really aware anymore of what's happening, you know, because it starts out, like, once he starts getting involved in the murders, it starts out, you know, he cries, you know, at the first one because he's forced to by this horrible, toxic figure, but then by the end, he's just numbed himself to everything. It's so fucked. And the way, the sound, the sound is brilliant. The sound... Though I think one of the most interesting things about the movie is the way that it uses diegetic noise that the actual noise itself is supposed to make you feel happy. It's supposed to be something that, you know, is bright and fun, but it's so loud and so obnoxious and so obvious in the mix that it just makes it the most, when contrasted against the visuals, is just the most horrendous thing. Like, for an example... There's a scene that involves happy brother fun love time scene, which is all in a wide shot, uh, just, you know, looking on, and you can hear the TV from the next room is playing, like, a game show, and it's at, like, such a high volume, presumably because somebody termed it up to hide the happy fun brother love time uh, shenanigans, because, you know, the the neighbors nosing in on that shit. And it's at such a volume, and it's like so saccharine and so loud, contrasted with these visuals. Ah, oh, it's phenomenal. Um, I know it seems like I'm orgasming over misery, and I, I like cinematic misery. Um, I, 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 I do, I, which is probably fucked. I, I like other types of movies as well. You know, my collection, I think there's some variance in there, some. Um, and I do like optimistic things. I like happy shows. I, I also really, I probably actually prefer in terms of shows. I like things that have more of a sense of, um, nostalgic melancholy, but when it comes to movies, it does seem that I favor really like depressing, (laughs) soul destroying bleak journeys through the depraved parts of the human condition. And that's what Snowtown is. Um, I highly, highly recommend Snowtown. Um, I'm, I'm very glad. It gives me hope that uh, when I return to Australia after next year, um, that I will be able to be involved in a film of this caliber, of this quality. And it's, uh, it's a reminder that my country can make good films, um, which they can. Um, I have a fair few in my collection, you've probably noticed, but um, n- nobody ever knows about them. So hopefully this makes even a couple of people who didn't know about this film know about it and they might go out and watch it. Um, so thank you, mysterious people who may watch Snowtown for supporting the Australian film industry. And then you'll be saddened to know that this director went on to make the Assassin's Creed movie, which is like, what the flying fuck? Up next, we have These Final Hours, which is another Australian film. And it's really funny. I look at just the way of the alphabetical nature of my collection, but a lot of the back end of my collection features a lot of Australian films. I don't know, I just think it's kind of interesting. Um, this is a very good pre-apocalyptic film. This is a film about a meteor that's about to crash into the earth and kill everybody, and there's no way of avoiding it, and it's just dealing with somebody who lived like a sort of party boy criminal, quasi-criminal lifestyle, trying to return a young girl to her parents before they all die as one last redeeming good deed. Um... This film was heavily advertised in Australia, and I'm very glad because um, it made its money back, which is the biggest problem with the Australian film industry today is that there are a lot of government funding bodies set up for people to ask to make an Australian film, but almost all of them require the film to be, like, have Australian values, which is such a fucking bullshitted, you know, you can bullshit that really easily. You know, there, there are a few factors. You need to have an Australian crew, you need to have a story that's either set in Australia or reflects the Australian landscape, and you need Australian values. And the problem with that is that it means that American productions can come in. A lot of films are filmed in Australia, particularly uh, in the sort of area that I live, 
because of tax reasons, they'll come in to get the tax rebates and the funding from the government, and they'll have a mostly Australian crew, so they can qualify for that, even though all the above the lines, all the directors, the writers, the producers are all American, and all the money's American, but most of the, the camera operators, the DOPs, the gaffers, the lighting, the technicians, all, all, the, all of the um, below the line will be Australian, and they can get around that. Um, they can waffle something about the Australian landscapes, because a lot of Australia has a lot of landscapes, and they can make some shit up about Australian values, because that's really fucking vague. So they can come in and take all the funding, and then other filmmakers, actual Australian filmmakers, have a lot of problem actually getting them up off the ground. And even when they do, it's then hard to market, because there's sort of a catch-22 in the Australian mindset, um, which is related to a concept called the cultural cringe, which is this idea that um, Australian, Australian art is will never exist as itself. It will always be judged compared to other films. So, for example, an Australian... Well, when 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 the cultural cringe as a concept was first sort of brought up, it was to refer to poets. So it might be like, you know, Banjo Patterson, who's a very Australi- a famous Australian poet, may be compared to, you know, a European poet of a similar car- calibre. You know, it would be, oh, he's the... You know, he's the Australian Poe or something like that. He can't exist as his own thing. He's always being compared to another culture because our culture is seen as inferior by ourselves. Um, And so that concept is very prevalent. So there's sort of a catch-22 where a lot of people don't think Australian films are good, so they don't see them, which means that they don't get made because nobody goes seeing them. Um, This film, however, the reason I brought all that up is because this film made its budget back. A lot of films don't. Snowtown didn't make its money back, which breaks my heart. Um, Animal Kingdom barely broke even. Um, and then a few other ones that aren't in my collection, say something like uh, there's a movie called Felony, which is pretty good. Um, a movie called Ten Canoes, which did pretty well in the art uh, crowd, but didn't make its money back. Things like Mad Max obviously do, but that's in sort of hindsight. Um, and when it's exported to a, a foreign market. Well, actually, the first Mad Max broke records for being the... Um, for being the... Uh, the most making them oh god what was it it was like being the most profitable film compared to its budget because it was made on nothing but in in the modern era it's really hard for australian films to make their money back this film did it made double its budget which may not seem like a lot compared you know american films make that routinely that's seen as doing okay in america but i feel see this as uh, a success of the marketing of this film So now we have Under the Skin, and this is a very tough film to talk about. I have a lot to say on it. I've been planning to do a review for a while. I'm hoping that I'll try and smash it out before I before I leave. Um, mainly because it'll be a bit different style. It'll probably be a video that I can actually put together quite quickly. But the reason it's taken so long is because I had to figure out exactly how to express how I feel about Under the Skin. Because it's a film that, at the end of the day, I fucking love it. It's one of my favorite films. It's so good. The way it's constructed, some of the scenes are just perfectly built for my sensibilities. Especially when it comes to sci-fi horror. And especially, (laughs) you can probably tell them, looking at my collection, you can probably tell I'm quite a big fan of science fiction. Considering how many films in there are science fiction. Um, And this is just... An approach to science fiction that I love and I don't get to see too much of, which is science fiction without actually showing the science fiction. Because this is a film that obscures everything. You get no answers. None. You don't even get the questions, really. It's And I think it's kind of amazing that the film pulls it off without telling you anything about anything of what's happening. It, everything is concealed... Um, even to the character, but even to the alien by the end of the film, because it's basically the main premise of the film is Scarlett Johansson is an alien who's disguised as a human who was harvesting them for an unknown purpose. And that's basically all you ever learn about the reason. You don't learn about the reasons why they're harvesting them. You don't even really learn how they're harvesting them. The way it's visually represented is so vague that you don't know how literal to take it, even though those the way it's visually represented is fucking amazing. Yeah. There's one scene in particular that will never leave my conscious. And if, consciousness, I should say, um, and if you've seen the film, you know which scene I'm talking about. If you haven't seen the film, I'm not going to ruin that scene because that scene is amazing. 
So obviously I love it, but I do have my problems with the end, but then I also don't because my film analysis fucking weirdo loser fucking film graduate brain is spinning it into such a way that I could like it. But they're in conflict. And I and so it took me a long time, and I finally, I think, nutted out uh, a review. Um, and I've got a script, and I'm probably just going to have to record it and try and get it out before the end of January. Um, but if I don't, then there's that. Anyway, if you... I really like Under the Skin. I think you should check it out if you're interested in science fiction at all because it's one of the most interesting approaches to science fiction in a film, for specifically a film that I've seen in the past couple decades. Well, that's been here in the past couple decades. And I know it's high praise, but I, I genuinely think that. And I'm, again, I'm not as pissed off with this cover, but this is the inferior cover because it's just her head. Um, there are other covers which are the same shot, which I think is the one in the, in the US and in North America and in Europe, which is her head superimposed over a star background. And it's just so much better. It's so simple. Like, I don't know why they went with this. It's not as bad or obnoxious as say something like the enemy cover, which is definitely worse. But I just don't know why they did this. Um, anyway, Under the Skin, highly recommend it if that sounds like your thing. If you want answers, don't watch it. But if you're okay with not getting answers, watch it. Park Chan Walks The Vengeance Trilogy. This is one of those trilogies where it's a thematic grouping of films. They're not set in the same universe. They don't feature any of the same characters. It's just they all tackle similar themes and uh, similar approaches to their editing and um, their yeah, construction. Um, all three films are brilliant. They're all really good. Um, they're not all equal, but I like all of them, and I'm, that's why I'm, I was glad to be able to get it in this collection, which has all three. The three films, uh, if you're not aware, are uh, Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, this is in release order. Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, Old Boy, and Lady Vengeance. Um, of them, I'd say Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance is my favorite, but Old Boy is probably the better film, if that makes any sense, because Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance is just, of all of them, it's the bleakest. It's the one that just downright approaches revenge just leads to nothing good in most cases. It's just a... It's also fun. It's kind of the funniest in a weird way, Park Chan Walk is a master at black comedy, and I mean black comedy, because it's just the situation is so fucked. There's no getting better. There's no release, so all you have to do it sometimes is just laugh at how miserable the situation is. And I think Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance best captures that. Old Boy has the most going on in terms of like pathos, in terms of like it's like people have pointed out before that it's like a Greek tragedy in its construction and its themes. The final showdown, the final scene, has one of the best reveals in cinematic history. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm not going to go into it. Um, it's an amazing film. It's probably the easiest of all three to get into. Most people tend to watch Old Boy and then watch the other two, which I think is a fine pathway because it's, pro yeah, it is probably the most accessible of all of them. And it has some pretty, still pretty interesting directorial choices. And then you got Lady Vengeance, which is probably the weakest of them. But also, kind of the most interesting, it has some of the craziest directorial choices. The version that I have, there are two versions of the film. One's just the regular version, which is color graded normally. And then there's another version of the film, which is the version, yeah, like I said, the version I have, where it starts out color graded normally, and then slowly throughout the film, it gets more and more desaturated until it's black and white. And having watched the two, I prefer the version that goes to black and white, because it makes the final scene, because unlike, say, Old Boy or... Mr. Vengeance, where the violence is sort of sparodic throughout. Lady Vengeance saves most of the extreme uh, visceral violence for the end. Um, and so having the process of gradual black and white is like the process of gradually morality leaving the room as she becomes less and less sure what she's doing is right. But that's what the end scene sort of implies is like a so it's, it's, it's probably got it's probably the most optimistic of them all as well it has the closest thing to a happy ending of the three of them it's still not a very happy ending but it's the closest thing there um but yeah all of them are, are really really good i highly recommend checking even if you just watch old boy um or any of them if any of them i guess i should give a basic plot synopsis of all three I, I don't know I don't know how condescending that is whenever I'm, I'm doing these because I don't know how many people actually watching these have seen the films I'm talking about and if it's condescending to get like a fucking, you know, like a nostalgia critic fucking review, fucking 
<laughs> overview when it's like, yes, I know I read, I can read Wikipedia as well, but I guess I'll do it really quickly. So Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance is a deaf guy who wants to get uh, enough money for a kidney operation for his uh, sister, who's like incredibly, incredibly sick and ends up kidnapping uh, his boss's daughter in order to do it. Uh, old boy is about a man who's in prison for 15 years, suddenly released, and is trying to track down his kidnappers. And Lady Vengeance is a very similar concept where uh, a man, she's forced to take the blame for murder that her, um, when she was in high school, uh, her older lover forced her into going to prison and she finally gets out and she wants to wrong every, she wants to solve everyone who's ever wronged her. All three of them deal with very similar things in like a different sort of way. You can see Park Chan Walk get more confident with being bold with his directorial choices across all of them. There's some weird shit in Lady Ventures, man. <laughs> um, all three are good. I'm glad to own all three. And I think um, they're a shining example of what those South Koreans know what to do, man, when it comes to, when it comes, or at least the cream of the crop South Koreans know what to do. Um, and because South Korean, the South Korean film industry is so small the cream of the crop there's a lot of them <laughs> there's a fantastic story of uh park chan wook uh stealing a dvd of bong joon ho's and not giving it back which i just think is the cutest thing i love it yeah all three of these films i highly recommend any of them old boy is probably the easiest to get into so maybe start there next up we have the witch which i know is supposed to be pronounced witch but that's how it's stylized this is one of the most impressive debuts i've ever seen not many filmmakers come swinging out the gate like this but as an as an accomplished film as this one um yeah it, it joins the likes of you know citizen kane cast of caliostro uh you know like the, the films that just where they just they know what they're doing immediately it's incredible um it's the story of the, this is a story of like it's set in the 1600s uh, it's called a new england folk tale and 1600s where a very puritanical family is kicked out of the village for their radicalist ideas and they're uh, tormented by a witch as their family falls apart. And one of the great things, a lot of people point out, one of the great things about the film is that a lot of the times a horror film of this style, this caliber, would usually, you know, leave a psychological element to it of like, is the witch even real or not? Um, and I usually enjoy that. I do enjoy that. I enjoy things like the Blair Witch Project, which leave it up to you to decide whether there was actually anything supernatural happening. But I also really appreciate in this film, it's just straight up, nah, dude, there's a witch. <laughs> there, are, There's a witch that's fucking with him, um, which makes it more, kind of gives a sense of dramatic irony because the, the characters start thinking maybe it's not real, but you know it is. And it's just one by one, they just succumb and it's just the most miserable thing and I've said that a lot, and I'll say it again, but I think misery does sort of translate to cinema pretty well. And I think especially nowadays, on an independent level, it's very easy to get misery or melancholy to translate to the audience. Maybe that's what it says something about the times, but I think just at that level, it's sort of easier to do because it's something that you can do with a lot less. Um, that's my theory, though, of why a lot of independent films do tend to have that sort of vibe to them. Um, one of the most interesting things about this, though, is how much it commits to the time period it's set. It really, really tries to co and connect to the zeitgeist of the time. Like, everybody speaks with these New England dialects of the dialect of, like, the 1600s. So it's almost like, it's like Middle English. You can barely understand what they're saying. And it's all the more impressive because of how many child actors are in the movie and how many of them are emoting while pulling off this dialect. It's really, really impressive. And you watch some of the behind-the-scenes stuff and, you know, they pulled it from, like, um, old journals that were written back then, old folk stories that they found, you know, in uh, the director's basement. And so it feels really natural, and it's just one of those things where a lot of the time, you know, you can forgive films for not going to that degree because it's a bit of a fucking hassle, and especially with kids, but when it's pulled off, man, man, is it worth it. And it does that. Same thing with the production, with the design. Um, I, it took me forever to realize that the main actor is actually the fucking Chris Finch from The Office. So it's like, man, that guy had chops I wasn't aware of. Um, really, really, really good horror film. Fantastic horror film. One of the best, yeah, one of the best, uh, the best debuts of all time. And if you want to see that kind of thing, if that's your bag, if you're, uh, 
if if you want grounded well not grounded but i don't know what i'm trying to say here anymore i think i've said enough of what to say about the vich uh i can't really say anything else other than watch the vich because then you'll get everything else that i wasn't able to say from watching the vich watch the vich it's pretty good and now we have arrived at the final film in my collection or the blu-ray part of the collection at least and also the uh coveted fifth or i guess fourth uh Film in my top five favorite films. This film is Wake in Fright, and it's definitely my favorite Australian film of all time. Um, and it's one of those movies where it's a bit hard to explain why it's my favorite. On one hand, I can I can explain. The film itself is very very good. It's basically it's a European school teacher who's forced to do his prac basically in uh, rural Australia, and he's trying to get to Sydney to see his girlfriend for a week, and he stops off in sort of a bumfuck town in nowhere loses all his money gambling and he's stuck in the town and it's just sort of the nightmare of him just being stuck there and basically degrading to the point of the the yokels that he so um so was so derisive and so he had so much hatred of before and it's great it's it's incredibly disorienting incredibly well edited there's a scene where they go hunting kangaroos which is so visceral, especially since you know a lot of it's actual kangaroo footage, because the director was Canadian. Um, uh, and the director noted the similarities between rural Australia and rural Canada, so he was able to bring a fair sense of authenticity in portraying these people. Um, and it's also one of the things where it's like, despite how much you want to, like, you know, the main character, despite how much he thinks he's cultured and he's above everyone here, he's just as fucked as the people, the crowd he ends up falling into. And, I mean, he falls into a particularly bad crowd. The film doesn't paint everyone. It's like, you know, the cop, the local cop is bumbling, but he's a good person, which I think is good because at the, you know, the beginning of the film, he's like really condescending towards the cop. He's just trying to defend him. But, but then at the end of the film, the cop's the one who sort of like gets his head back on straight and almost, almost gets him out of there, but then he doesn't. There's a, there's a very great story of Martin Scorsese watching this at a, at, uh, at Cairns and being like, he's going to go all the way. He's going to do it. Oh my God. And like getting really like into the film, which is cool. So there's a lot of things I really like about the film. The way that the film shoots the, the, the outback is really great. You know, the, the outback does lend itself to cinema because it's just like, you get a wide angle lens and it's just like, there's nothing for miles, for kilometers, I should say, because I'm not American, but the opening shot in particular, it's, it's great. You see the school, see the school here and then you see the train station and then the camera does a 360 pan showing absolutely nothing until it gets back and showing the school again and it's so good it's fucking amazing so those reasons like the film itself but i think one of the reasons why this film is in my favorites is the story behind them the, the behind the film the and the not so much the making of it but this film has a tumultuous history because this film almost doesn't it almost didn't exist in this format there it almost there could have been a, a history an alternate history where i didn't own this blu-ray which i know is kind of like the lamest alternate history ever but the story behind the film was one of those reasons why i really like it because the when it came out it didn't the critics here liked it but a lot of audiences didn't because they, they felt it was a bit too much portraying them as yobbos which they are um but it did really well in europe and you know got a lot of acclaim but then it just sort of disappeared nobody picked it up it didn't get a very good release there was a really shitty vhs release but it wasn't usable and of course vhs is degraded so much faster over time because of the magnetic tape and so for a while it was regarded as a lost film and the editor of the film went on like a 15 year journey or something to try and track down a working print um, obviously he was doing other stuff in that time, but like he tried so hard to find this film. And then eventually, I think only in like 2007, he found, he found a negative print in a huge bin in a factory, in a warehouse in Pittsburgh. And the, the bin was marked, uh, was labeled marked for destruction. And he talked to the foreman of the warehouse and they said that, yeah, if he was a week late, that everything in that warehouse would have been destroyed and the film would have really been lost forever and so you know there was re this really extensive cleanup process and then there was a lot of hubbub in the media um at the time because i remember my film teacher in high school um 
was the one telling me that she was really, really excited this was coming out. And so it generated this fair amount of hype and then it got this big, big, big re-release. And now, you know, it's regarded as one of the pinnacle movements of the Australian New Wave, which was the, the, the 70s when the government introduced a series of tax, uh, tax rebates to incentivize um, Australian films. And now this is considered, where once before it was just a lost, oh, just a relic of that era, no one really knows about it. It's now considered the pinnacle of that movement. And that story is, I don't know, I guess I'm in love with that story, this idea that, you know, art is something, you know, because art, art is two things at the end of the day. It's the tangible physical copy, the tan the physical thing that is made and you, you experience and you consume, and then it's the symbolic, the symbolic meaning that you take from it. And this idea that the symbolic meaning that I could take from this film that has had an impact on me and especially in the way I like to and what I like to, you know, my personal tastes and what I like in film almost didn't happen because the physical, the physical world of art was almost gone forever, but then it was saved. I don't know. I, I, li I like that story and I like the idea that a film... Something as simple as a film can be saved, you know? And uh, it's one of two films in history to have been screened twice at Cannes, uh, at Cannes Film Festival, which I think is a pretty impressive feat. So I think those two things combined, the fact that I actually do genuinely really like the film, and that that story behind the film is the reason that propels it into the into the heights that it is. Because I can see a lot of people not really seeing the big deal about it, especially when I praise it a lot. But for me at least... That's why I have such a grand attachment to it, and that's why it's one of my favorite films, and that's why I'm incredibly glad to have it in my collection, and I think that's a really fitting way to end the collection video. So, yeah, that was the film collection. Um, I don't really have anything to say for this ending because I think the last one was a bit disastrous. I think this video will end up being a fair bit longer than the anime one, and I don't have a good way to... I didn't have a good way to begin this video, and I don't have a good way to win this video, so I think I'm just gonna... Unlike last time where I faked it out, I'm just gonna cut the black.